I found this guy tweeted something a couple days ago, whenever it was hilarious. He goes, most people's alarm clock is David Goggins telling them to wake up and get after it. My alarm clock is David Senra yelling at me, telling me to be like Edwin Land. <laughs> and I was like, all right, repetition works. <laughs> Who got the truth? Is it you, is it you, is it you? Who got the truth now? Is it you, is it you, is it you? Sit me down, say it straight, another story on the way. Who got the truth? Welcome to this special episode of Acquired, the podcast about great technology companies and the stories and playbooks behind them. I'm Ben Gilbert. I'm David Rosenthal. And we are your hosts. Today's episode is our next installment of Acquired Sessions, a video format on YouTube that we started playing with last year. Our guest today is David Senra of the Founders Podcast. David is quite possibly the only person we know who is more obsessed than us <laughs> with business history and the lessons that great founders teach us. David, David Senra, that is, has read hundreds of founder biographies and done deep episodes on them all. I don't know that I'm at hundreds yet as me, David, but I'm definitely in dozens. <laughs> I aspire to be at hundreds, but David Senra is just one of our closest podcaster friends and friends period out there. His show is awesome. Here on this episode, we had him out to my living room here in San Francisco, and we had just a awesome, really fun, multi-multi-hour conversation, just like the ones that he and I have scheduled every month on Zoom when the mics are off. And it was super organic, super unstructured. We covered a ton of ground, including that I think two nights before we recorded, David was just coming up from LA where he had dinner with Charlie Munger. And so we spent a lot of time talking about that. Charlie's influence on David, his and Warren's influence on all three of us, a bunch of thoughts on advice generally. And as you can imagine, David just sprinkled dozens and dozens of historical examples and founder stories throughout the episode. It is crazy. Every time someone's making a point, he'll dive in. This is just like that thing Edwin Land said that one time. <laughs> or David Ogilvy or Coco Chanel or who have you. David is definitely close with the eminent dead. I will say after editing this episode, I had one enormous takeaway. David Senra is really, really into podcasting. So get fired up to meet him on his level. All right, quick things. Go follow ACQ2, brand new show. Search it at any podcast player available for free. Become an LP. There is voting going on right now for our next episode, which LPs all have input on. And for every new LP that joins, we will shoot you an email to your inbox Voting closes about a week after this comes out, and we are straight up picking whatever you tell us the next episode should be with really no editorial from us. So help us direct the next episode. Join the Slack. It is one of the only places on the internet with this super high level of incredibly thoughtful discussion by well-connected, kind folks with a deep appreciation for history. People meet co-founders, they find jobs. And they get nuanced takes on the news of the day in there. So join at acquired.fm slash slack. Lastly, this show is not investment advice. David and I may have investments in the companies we discuss. And this show is for informational and entertainment purposes only. Now, on to Acquired Sessions. So, David, do you want to tell us who you had dinner with the other night? I had a three-hour dinner with Charlie Munger. That is awesome. Where I could How ask him do? any questions that you want. Well, first of all, I guess we should back up. It's like there's a reason that he's so admired, right, by so many people. But for for me particularly, um, you get to lot, meet a lot of really interesting people because of the work that we do, right? Yep. And so that's like a, a blessing and something that I know we've had conversations in the past that we deeply appreciate. But Charlie's a different level for me. Like I literally think of him like the wise grandfather I never had. Um, mm. I, you know, I've met all kinds of people. I don't really get like nervous or starstruck. I was legitimately like, shaking the day before. I was like, I cannot believe, I, did, I didn't want to tell that many people because like, this is just, there's no way this is going to happen. Like, I just, I won't believe it till it actually happens. We, we do very similar work, right? Where it's just like, how many people have spent six, seven years, tens of thousands of hours reading hundreds of books about the history of entrepreneurship and investing and then not only reading it, taking notes on it, making it's a podcast. And Charlie and Warren. Yeah. And so, <laughs> what, and the reason I bring that up is because you think about all the different companies and founders you guys have studied, all the different companies and founders that I've studied, right? And like, even amongst a, the rarest group of people, Charlie still stands out. And the crazy yeah. thing is, he's 99, right? 
And so I get there and we start off in his library, which is like the best place for me that you could possibly see. How, and so, set, set the stage more. How, how big is the library? Like how many books are we talking about? It's, it's, so it's not, it's, so his, uh, his, one of his family members was there too. And she's like, oh, this is like nothing. <laughs> this is like the front room. Wait till you see the back. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, it, it's similar to like the room we're in, like, you know, very similar size and, you know, floor to ceiling shelves. And so I'm with a, a, a small group of friends. It's, in fact, uh, mutual friends for us. So the people that set this up for us or for me was uh, Andrew Wilkinson and Chris from the founders of Tiny, mm. who are mutual friends. And um, and so we're sitting there, and there's actually a funny thing where it starts out, and they they know both Warren and Charlie. They've talked to them before, so they go right into it. And then like I'm sitting there, and I had this whole list of probably like 25 questions. I was going to ask <laughs> if you like prepared in advance. I know you did. I never got the chance to open my phone. <laughs> Because I was just sitting there, I was like, I'm looking at him, and he's, you know, very close. Like, you know, maybe right. a little bit further oh, from me. That was super was. disrespectful to, like, take up my phone. To... Yeah, that too. And I had, you know, read every single book on Charlie. I watched all of his videos. Like, I have studied this guy forever. And so every time he had said, hey, read this book, I go and read the book. And then I see a bunch of the books that he has recommended behind him. So people are like, oh, was he as, like, you expected? Like, they say, hey, be careful, don't meet your heroes, right? It's like he was unbelievably gracious hmm. you know unbelievable like uh i was like hey charlie you mind if i take a look at your bookshelf right he's just like do whatever you want just unbelievably polite still like biting intellect ferocious intelligence at 99 at 99 so we were talking earlier um uh downstairs where the scary thing about charlie is I remember asking a question about Henry Kaiser, uh, this guy that was super famous when Charlie was younger. He built like 100 companies, built the Hoover Dam. Like he was as famous in his time as like Elon Musk is today, right? But no one knows who he is. Um, and I was asking questions about Charlie in the book and his recall is just insane. So the point where I asked him, I go, how do you know all this, Charlie? He goes, I knew his partner. <laughs> and then he starts telling stories about being, knowing, like having a relationship with Henry Kaiser's business partner. And then oh. all these... Three hours of just unbelievable stories. And then I go, Charlie, like, how do you remember all this stuff? Like, do you write, where, like, do you take notes? Do you reread the books over and over again? He's like, nope. And all I could think of was like, imagine. Wow. That guy's mind at 99 is still so sharp. I had brought a gift for him because he's, he talks about like um, Rockefeller all the time. I bought him this special edition, uh, centennial edition version of Henry Flagler's biography. Oh, Flagler, yes. So I, I live in Miami. The, the guy, Les Sandiford, I think is his, the author of that book. Um, he is good friends with, there's only like one local bookshop in Miami called Books of Books. And so Les is a local author who's good friends with the owner of that bookstore. So they did a, you can't get this book anywhere else. It's a special edition book. Because Flagler moved to Florida later After in life, the Standard right? Oil thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, he, he's got a fascinating story. We talked about that where, he, made, he was unbelievably wealthy because of Standard Oil. Yep. He's, you know, 50, 60, 70 years old when he's doing this. And he's just like, oh, what am I doing now? I'll build an entire state. When he gets to Miami, Miami is little less than 500 people living in a swamp. He just can't live there. There was no AC at the time. And so then he builds the, the world's first uh, railroad right. over for connecting uh, the Florida Keys. He just essentially, like, you read that book and you're like, oh, humans have no limits other than the ones we put on ourselves. And so that's mm. what Flagler does. He just stretches it. And he does some terrible things too, where it's like, yeah. wanted to find a way to divorce his wife. So he literally moves to another state because he couldn't be divorced in New York, bribes the, 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 the government of Florida. They create the Flagler law, which allows him to get a divorce. Then he does that like a few, think a few times. I think he's like in the seventies and marries like a 30 year old. Like, <laughs> so it's not all good. Yeah. But th that guy's like, oh, I, the, your rules don't apply to me. Like, I will build whatever I want. He built in infrastructure, hotels, everything else. This is like one of my the things that I keep learning from Founders Podcast. And I'm curious if you do it intentionally or if you like try not to do it. But like every single time I'm like, oh, people aren't perfect. Like n none of your heroes are perfect. And do you find yourself like, because we, we run into this on Acquired a lot where like it's not as fun to tell stories about terrible people. And so you you, you like don't want to show someone's negative side as mm -hmm. much because it doesn't like it's just. It, well, we, we like we fall in love with them too right. when we're doing right. that. Right. And you're like, wow, they're the most extraordinary person on this one axis to ever live. And we, we should talk about how they're a flawed person in many ways, but it's not fun to dwell on like you kind of want to like move through that and be like yep yep they were flawed here's the next amazing thing that they did like how do you handle that like you know how a normal biography is written right it's like 
way too much family history. Like I want to know some family history. I don't want five generations back. Right. Stop. Like I don't want to know the origination of their last name. I don't need that. I want to know like- And you're like the most qualified person in the world to critique a biography <laughs> writing style at this point. So. so why we're reading it is like everyone wants to know the climb, right? It's like, yes. how did you, you guys, I just went through your entire, to get part of the prep for Charlie is listening to all of your Berkshire episodes, right? Where you guys do a fantastic ep- uh, job on this. Because like the first two is like the young Charlie, the young Warren. Yeah. So I would literally, and I've done this forever. It's like, I don't, when you think of Warren Buffett or Ben Franklin or George Washington or anybody that's super famous, when we see them, it's like, oh, who's the Ben Franklin on the $100 bill, right? Or yeah. who's the Washington on the dollar bill? Or who's Buffett at the the meeting in Omaha? It's like, no, no, that that's the guy that is is enjoying the fruits of the person right. that actually built right. the empire. That's, that's the I go, yeah. I go and stare at pictures like a freak at like of young Charlie Munger when he was like 38 or young yeah. Warren Buffett. Right, they 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 were like us. They looked like our, they were young people once. Yeah. In in uh in our Berkshire series, the first did we end the first episode without even getting to Berkshire yet? I think we I might. Think have yeah, it was the partnership. It was just the partnership. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned it on the Walmart episode where it's like everybody says, "Oh, Sam Walton didn't start Walmart until he's forty four. Yeah, but he was doing twenty five years of practice and learning, and he yeah. wasn't just sitting on his ass like, starting a bunch of stuff that looked an awful lot like Walmart. Yes, yep. learning from that. And so the, the the which is totally like I mean aside, but we have no agenda here. Uh, that is like, I think both an advantage that like we have all three of us, and like kind of a secret that we have, which is that like we wanted we did Walmart because we wanted to do Amazon, and so we were like, how do we do Amazon? Right, we got to do Walmart first. People want this. Like now, this is the right way to study things. I think I'm glad you brought that up because I think this is why people get a lot of value, and I don't want it to make us about like, hey, this is an acquired founder show. The reason that some of the people in our audiences are the most successful people in the world. They're all reading biographies. They're all studying the history of, uh, of business. I told you guys uh, a few weeks ago, I, had, I was very lucky to have a two hour one-on-one lunch with Sam Zell that I didn't think was possible. What I realized in that conversation is like, you don't make, you don't, Sam Zell sold his company for almost $40 billion, right? Yeah. $38 billion, whatever it was. It's like, you don't build a company, sell for $40 billion and then learn all this shit. It's like, he was doing this since he was, up, since he was young. We were talking in his autobiography, well, he talks about- I, I think my favorite episode of your podcast yeah. is the Kobe Bryant episode. Yeah. Because like, this is what these guys are doing. They're like Kobe Bryant. They're watching game tape. They're watching game tape. They're working on the fundamentals from the time they're 12 through the time they die. They don't stop. I think that's what um, we're listening to Acquired and Founders is, is you're watching game tape of History's Grace Entrepreneurs. Sam did this when he was younger. But- this ties together where um, Bill Gurley had a fantastic quote about this, a tweet about this, when all that crypto was going crazy and like the run up and people were getting rich. And he's like, one thing I don't like, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't, I wasn't expecting to talk about this. He's like, I don't like the these young, the younger people denigrating the people that came before them. Yeah. And he's like, yeah. he made the point that none of the none of history's greatest entrepreneurs and investors did that. They had the opposite perspective. All of them had idols. You just made the point. You can't understand Jeff Bezos until you study Sam Walton. You can't understand Sam Walton until you understand J.C. Penney and Sol Price and, and even all these contemporaries. Guys. Like the point that Walton always made was, I don't think my competitors are stupid. I want to go shop my yep. competitors and get all of their very best insights and then bring them into my store. Yeah, hundred percent. They're, they're learning machines. Yeah. And so you get to Charlie's going tying this all back to this. You get to Charlie's bookshelf and it's just biographies I've never even heard of. And I do this for a living. <laughs> I do it for a living. I was like, what is this book? And then I started looking. I was like, oh, I'm just taking picture after picture after picture. I was like, I'm ordering every single one. So we're talking about this idea that like, that uh, the way to get truth is to weave together the tapestry of all of history stories of things that are adjacent to understand like how this opportunity to start some business came to be. And you always have to like all history is revisionist and all history mm-hmm. is biased. And so I think one of the hardest things about making an acquired episode is figuring out like when we're looking at a source, like someone giving an industry talk who works at a company or like a biographer who chose to dedicate, you know, two years of their life to writing this book after working at Newsweek and covering the sector forever is like trying to mentally account for and discount f- from whatever bias and perspective they're coming in with to create whatever the source material is that we're using to then incorporate into our version of yes. here's how this thing happened, which is, that's like, I think it's the hardest part about what we do. And I'm curious if you ever think about that. I think about it all the time because people are like, oh, like survivorship bias or revisionist history and everything else. It's like, here's the problem. Like we humans don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. 
So like we could have this super long conversation between the three of us right now, then go in the other room and write down, you know, what just occurred. And yep. every single version is going to be different because it's viewed through all of our experience, the way we think, the, the words we use. And so what I'm looking at is like when I'm reading about Sam Walton, right? It's just like uh, the, 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 the story we both hit on all the podcasts because I've done a bunch of podcasts on Sam too, where it's like the guy's pissed off. He's just like driving him to store to store and he's like mountain roads taking forever. So he buys the plane and he realizes right. like, oh, this is a massive advantage because I'm doing something my competitors aren't, right? I'm flying over and you guys mentioned it too, which I thought was hilarious. He's like, and then he just lands and he's like, who owns that? Let me land and, and then he, he you know buys for action. So he's like, we're going to negotiate right now. I want to buy it from you. And so my point is, is like, okay, yes, that most likely occurred. But what is the idea behind that? It's do, you can have an advantage by doing something your competitors are not doing, right? Yep. Um, and it, this ties together what, you're, uh, what you just said. is like they all learn from somebody else. When we're reading these books and listening to these podcasts, it's like, what's the idea I can use in my life? We're not building the next Walmart. There's no way if we read Titan that we could tell, did this actually happen? Right. I don't know. But I'm looking for the ideas behind it. Not, yep. oh, I can, I'm going right. to verify for every single word in this book. That's ridiculous. Right. And it, the, the truth is always, it is always the case that the, a clean narrative is grafted onto a fact pattern. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, well, what I care about is the lessons I can learn from the clean narrative, not it, it does the fact pattern, if, if you had all the facts in totality, did it necessarily mean that it, you know, this was premeditated? It's like, eh, whether it was premeditated or not, yep. you know, the, the facts are the facts and like, maybe I Which can duplicate it in like, a different realm. For what we do, I mean... On a, I think on Acquired more than you, but especially because you will do multiple episodes of different books on the same people. And right. multiple episodes on the same book. Yeah, and multiple episodes <laughs> on the same book. Right. Your we're, format is We're better doing a, for... a narrative weave. Yeah. So like, you know. We're right? shooting the moon a little bit more yeah. in this respect. Like, y y your format lends itself to, so for anyone who's listening, like, Founders is more about, hey, I just read this book and I want to tell you what I learned from this book. And it's always biography. And like sometimes you'll do five different biographies on Edwin Land. And like if Acquired was going to do Polaroid, we would do Polaroid. The episode would right. be Polaroid. We would maybe it would be like Polaroid part one and part two, or like maybe at some point we'd, we'd have one there. We'd have like someone on to like talk about the story, you know, in addition to our one canonical episode. But like it, we would be shooting the moon on like, let's make sure that we get the Polaroid story as right. It's almost like, how do we find the correct average of all of the other stories to create the canonical version? I wasn't expecting to quote Bill Gurley two times early so far, but um, he- that This is how you know this is gonna be a that, good episode. That fantastic uh, talk he gave, which to me is the best talk for entrepreneurs and investors on YouTube. It's called Running Down a Dream, yep. How to Survive and Thrive in a Career You Love, right? So and he says, he's like, listen, in the age of the internet, he's like, you don't have to be the smartest person, right? Charlie Munger, after talking to him, I, whatever mind that dude has, I don't have that. And I'm cool with that. Like, I could not imagine trying to compete against that guy 40 years ago. Like, he would destroy me, right? He's got a super mind that I don't have. But what Bill says is like, you may, like, you don't have to be the smartest person, but you can collect more, the most information. And, he's, and he holds you to a high standard in that talk. Bill's like, listen, in the age of the internet, the, all the information you possibly need, right, is right at your fingertips. You have no excuse not to do this. And so he gives the example of... If you, you, you want to be a domain expert in whatever you're doing, like within two years of intense study, if you're doing that and you're focused on it, it's like you're going to get to the point where like you know more than maybe anybody else. And so that's my whole thing was like when you talk to, you've never met a founder or an entrepreneur that's like kind of into, into entrepreneurship. It's like, no, it's our lives. Yeah, yeah. So of course, the reason why so many of them listen to both of our shows, right? It's because they're building machines where they literally can turn knowledge into profit, right? Uh, I, I become close friends. Uh, with the guy through the podcast, he's a young kid. I don't, I, don't, I don't mean to call him a kid. He's not a kid, but he's a lot younger than I am. And he's like 28 years old. And we were on the phone the other day because he had a very serious offer for a company he owns like 95% of, and they were going to um, they were gonna give him $100 million, right? He winds up saying no to it. But the point is, is like, when you talk to him, um, you know, he's listened to all the episodes, he's read like 60 of the books. He'll text me a picture of like, he won't even tell me what the book. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure I read that. Like, he's like, oh yeah, it's from this episode. It's like, oh, why? What if he finds one idea in a book, one idea in a podcast, and it gives a 10% improvement on his company? It's a 10 million fucking dollar idea. Yeah. Well, we were talking about this earlier, like this dinner that you, you have with Charlie. It sounds like yeah. the Charlie is just like a very curiosity-driven machine. But we know there, there's lots of folks that have regular dinners yeah. and have groups of people often geographically dispersed. Mm -hmm. Why do they do it? Why is it worth their time, their money, their effort? It's that they get one idea. 
the leverage that they can get on that is Charlie astronomical. Tell, Charlie tells a story. He's like, yeah, uh, I made $400 million from reading Barron's for 50 years. And you're like, what the, what are you talking about, Charlie? And, <laughs> and like, how do you well, quantify that? Because he does. So he goes, I read, uh, this isn't something he said at dinner. I've heard him say publicly. He's like, I read Barron's every, uh, all the time for 50 years. I found one idea that I can act on. I made $50 million on that deal. And then I took that $50 million and I gave it to Lee Lu. Is that the? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Lee, Lee, I, gave that 50, I gave that 50 million to Lee Lu, and Lee Lu turned it into $400 million. That's how I made $400 million from reading Barron's. Wow. And listen, I'm not, and this is another thing where I feel like everybody's like, oh, this time is different. This is new. It's like human nature has never changed. It will never change. This time is not different. You're just experience. The, the difference is you're, if you don't study the history of the people that came before you, you're just ignorant and making mistakes that people already saw in the past. Uh, learning from history is a form of leverage. Hmm. He has billions and billions, of, or not, yeah, billions and billions of years of co- collective, like, human history. You know, this guy spent 70 years, and there's thousands of them. And, like, Sam Walton's book, how many, how many people spent 50 years in one industry, in the retail industry? Yeah. And he distilled it down and then to the most important. And then you could read it in a week, and then you could listen to Acquire's episodes. You can listen to David's episodes on Sam. Okay, this and, is good. In addition so, to that. So the question is, then, do you have... 90% of Sam's wisdom, or do you have 0.1% of Sam's wisdom after? There's no way you have 90%. Right. Because, like, it, the time. Right. Like, the, the instincts. I was just rewatching uh, Peter Thiel's talk at uh, Y Combinator. He says, Competition is for losers. Oh, yeah. And he goes, One thing that we do in Silicon Valley, it's a classic. One thing we do in Silicon Valley is we overrate, overvalue growth rates and undervalue durability. Mm. And he's like, That doesn't make sense for a technology company because all your profits, the vast majority of profits, are 20 years in the future. And so if you're trying to optimize for growth and that, that, that over-optimization can cause your company to go out of business, you're never going to collect that. You optimize for durability first, dummy. Like that's to me, like my yeah. interpretation of what he's, what he's saying, right? Yeah, so you're going to get, you know, 1% probably, maybe yeah. 5%. But that's still enormous leverage because you read it in five hours and he took 50 years to well, accumulate it's, everything. It's like, and it's what, Sam Walton's wisdom. And it's what you do with the idea. I know you've talked about this before, but like what was, what was the moment where you're like, I'm gonna I'm gonna start this podcast. Like it's crazy, right? What you do? You you talk to a microphone yourself every week. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my friend. Not that I think you're crazy. Oh, you, I definitely you, am. You, you are, but in a good no, way. I definitely am nuts for sure. <laughs> um, and that's gonna be like we could talk about. Um, did you guys read Jeff Bezos's last shareholder letter before he? Yeah. The one of the best lines he has is at the end. He's like, "Differentiation is survival." And so they think about that, like how hard, like they say, let's say somebody says, damn, I love what Ben and Dave are doing. I'm going to do the exact same thing. They can jump in and try to do that, right? But you yeah, have six right. years of experience. You have right. 600 hours out right. there. You have to, to counter position against have, us yeah. or address a different audience or. Exactly. Which, by so, the way, they definitely should. Every time I talk to somebody who wants to, I, I, without, I'm always like, you absolutely should do this. Yeah. And, but, and you will, even if you never succeed in terms of any like numerical success or like, you will succeed because you are learning. Like, So being a nut job and completely crazy is, I think, makes you harder to compete with. And it's also, it, we're going to go all over the map here, but it's impossible not to be that. Like, think about how seeped you guys are in the same information that I am, where it always says, oh, you're the sum of the first of your five friends or whatever, right? Well, it's like, it's also like what you, you're the sum of your podcasts you listen right. to and the books you read. Oh, and so it's what your happens, five friends, including your parasocial relationships. Right. And so now what happens is like, you mentioned, dude, like you won't even read like one book about him, you'll go crazy. And so what happens is when I'm really interested in somebody, I will, I listen to Bill Gurley. Again, I just take advice from people who are smarter than me. Bill said, go collect everybody, everything you can. Okay, I'm good. I'll do that. This is very, these are simple ideas. Yeah. And so I'll find somebody that's interesting. I'll read everything about him. And so with Charlie, I have like a little Charlie Munger on my shoulder. I have a little Steve Jobs, a little Edwin Land, a little David Ogilvy, Estee Lauder, Coco Chanel, all these people that have been heroes of mine, James Dyson. And so now I'm presented with a situation. It's like, what would they do? And you have, if you read and spend and absorb everything that's out there about these people, like you'll have an idea of like how they would respond. Did you guys ever read Ken Cosienda's book, Creative Selection? Uh-uh. About no. that? Oh, that's shocking. Did he, you guys he, he worked on the original human he, interface for the iPhone. He, so he uh, made the the keyboard for when it was still that's like, right. uh, Operation iPhone Purple OS. or something. Yeah. Uh, P2. The keyboard. He made Safari before the iPhone. He has this excellent book that I've read like three times called Creative Selection. I think the, the, the design, how Apple designed products in the golden age of Steve Jobs might be the subtitle. But he talked about that where he, he demoed to Steve, right? And 
Steve doesn't give a shit about your idea. You're not going to describe it to him. You're going to demo and you're going to hand it to him. And so they iterate, you guys already know this, they iterate to a series of demos. And it's based on Steve's taste. <laughs> like he is not, oh, let's talk about this. Like, nope, do this, do this, that. And right. so Ken has a great line in the book where he's like, demoing for Steve is like asking questions to the Oracle of Delphi, except the Oracle of Delphi would like respond with a riddle. And he's like, no, no, Steve was unbelievably like crystal clear. You understood him. Out of every single person I've ever studied, Steve Jobs is by far the clearest thinker I have ever come across. Hmm. Like, I, he's just gifted at that. Charlie is like the Oracle, and it's crystal clear. You are not, like, you are going to understand what he's, the idea he's trying to get into your brain, for sure. Um, but my point being is, like, all of the people that we study, they don't denigrate the past. They, Steve Jobs, the reason I'm so obsessed with Evan Land, I read in a uh, biography, when Steve was, like, 20, in his 20s, Edwin Land is in like his 70s, he goes and meets Edwin Land and he goes, visiting Edwin Land was like visiting a shrine. He's like, he is my hero. More people should try to be like that. And then you guys made the point in that, you know, Jeff Bezos took a lot of ideas from Sam. Uh, who took a bunch of ideas from Sony too? Steve and oh, yeah. Jeff. So the, you always find these people where you're like, oh, I thought this was a Steve Jobs idea. Right. No. no, it's an Akio Morita idea. Yeah, or an Edwin or, Land, or an idea. Edwin Land idea. Like the, when we used to watch the um, presentations that Steve would give, where he's like, "Oh, we're building at the intersection of technology and liberal uh, arts." He put it put it up on the screen. It he ripped that off wholesale. Edwin Land yeah. said that exact word. But that's the point. It's like you're never going to find anybody gets to the top of their profession without doing the work, like studying the people that came before them and learning from them and admiring them. This is a good like sort of personal pivot and, and something I've never asked you in all the hours we've spent. It's crazy. This is the first time we've met in person. Yeah. Like we spent hours and hours and hours on Zoom. Uh, how did you like decide that this is what you were going to do with your time on this planet? And like how did, what led to this? Okay. So I, you know, Jer our mutual friend Jeremy from Formula of Tiny. Yeah. Um, I just spent like a bunch of hours with him. He was in town in one sentence. He like he psychoanalyzed me better than anybody else ever has. He goes, "You didn't have any mentors growing up, so you like you have." Then you took it to like this extreme, and he said it more, much more eloquently than I am. But he's like, "You didn't have any mentors, so I view your career as like this psychopathic uh, search for like mentors that can help you." You know, and so like to answer your question, it's like I don't want to go into too much detail here, but uh, like I've only had one habit my whole life, and that was reading. I was reading for as long as I can remember. Uh, my mom passed away from breast cancer a couple years ago, and she, we didn't have like a lot of money, like long story, but like I was the first person not only to graduate college, but like high school in my family. Like I came from a family, like unfortunately both sides of the family, like no education, a lot of like just bad habits. So uh, I identify with a lot of what Charlie Munger says because he essentially observes bad behavior and then tries to do, do the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. So I was just, let me give you an example. I was just up in Canada, um, actually at an event uh, Andrew Wilkinson was hosting for a bunch of entrepreneurs. Me, Shane Parrish from the Knowledge Project and, uh, and Farnham Street was up there, Ben Wilson from How to Take Over the World, and we were doing this panel together. And Shane's the moderator, and we don't know what we're going to talk about beforehand. And so Shane asked the question, it's like, oh, what, um, what did you learn most from your upbringing or something like that, right? And I go, I learned not to do cocaine and to graduate high school. Like, so that kind of thing, right? And so there's just a bunch of anti-models. I thought about this as I was walking through the Tenderloin <laughs> this morning in San Francisco. And I was like, I should ha do this walk with my daughter as the best, mm, like, hey, mm. this is why you don't do drugs. Yeah. Like, this is the perfect example of, like, you would avoid, you observe bad behavior and then you do the opposite. So, long story short, I've always been obsessed with reading. Like, one of the best things my wife, my, my mom ever did was, even if we didn't have money for books, she would take me to the bookstore and just sit there. Like, you know, bookstores are so cool yeah. because they just let you read. They don't, no one comes here and is like, hey, you've been reading for an hour, like, you got to get out of here, you know? And just read and read and read. So I'll, was I'll, there anybody who like introduced you to reading in books, or you just like there was just something about sounds you? Sounds like his mom. Yeah, but no, she's she wasn't a big reader. The only thing she read was the Bible. Um, there was no books in the house when I was younger ever. Like, so my how parents, did you be like? I, I can't mom, answer take that. me to the bookstore. I can't answer that. All I can say is like my wife knows has known me for fifteen years, and her thing, what she says is, she like likes my family and gets along with them. But she goes, how did that come from that? <laughs> I know, it's like, it, it sounds like you have a classic, like, you're the one who made it out story. Sam Hinky, our mutual friend, actually gave me the way to think about this. And it's called the founder of your family, right? Mm. And it's the person that, like, 
and I used to call them, and it was a terrible name, but generational inflection points, <laughs> because you'd read this in the biography where you have like generation after generation of just not good things happening. And then one person just says, fuck this. It stops yeah. now. That's and what Rockefeller they, did. Rockefeller. Yep. Uh, I always think of Sam Bronfman, the guy that did um, Seagram's. Oh, yep. yeah. And he's in Canada growing up on, but like they were so, their, par their parents had lost so much money. They think they, they were Jewish and they had to like escape from persecution in Russia. I can't remember the, where they came from, but they go and they, they have to start all over and they're in Canada and like there's no heating and like they're freezing and like, he, he, so he has this like psychopathic drive to change, but you, that stays with you forever. So like once, you know, he builds this massive company and literally changes the, the trajectory of all of his uh, descendants. And as his, his daughter's an adult and she tells a story in the book where Sam is sitting there in like a mansion by a f next to a fire, f like shivering, thinking about how embarrassing it was to have to go to school with tattered clothing. It's just like, that guy's never gonna go back to yeah. that and he never, never loses it. So I just always been a reader. That's the only thing I've um, ever, like the only one unbroken habit I've always had. And so I just had this idea where like, I, would, I was obsessed with podcasts forever. I was obsessed with audio before there was such thing as a podcast. Hmm. Um, like I would listen to talk radio when I was a kid. And at that time, you know, it's, it's not like, there's no on-demand anything. You would right. listen, sports talk radio, politics talk radio. It's embarrassing. There was like this woman that used to be on at night. And people would write in like advice for love, their love life. And I'd listen to that. Just the, the idea of like, oh shit, there's all this information. Oh man, I used to listen to um, Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. Do you ever listen to this? Like it's when no. all the other radio programming sort of expires and then you enter the like one in the morning AM radio stuff. And it was like, you know, aliens yep. and like tons oh, of paranormal amazing. stuff. But it was like, if you, if you listen like, you know, the the Cavs game ends, I'm from Cleveland. And so like, then you listen to like the sports post game and then it goes into like the politics hour. And if you still can't fall asleep, then you're into like aliens. And it's like four hours of <laughs> that stuff. This, I, do you have a radio in your bedroom? Oh yeah. Yeah, I'd, like, I'd be able to, I don't, I imagine my parents probably came and turned it off, but like would leave it on while I fell asleep every wow. night. And then remember, like I remember, so you have the jump up from that and then the, the AM radio stations would then start streaming to, the, to your browser, the internet. It still yeah. wasn't on demand. So if you're not listening at three o'clock right. or 12, like you miss it, and then once I saw... Wasn't this what Mark Cuban's company was? His was like broadcasting audio for sports games, though, I think. Mm. I don't actually know. It's kind of yeah. funny. It's like an era It's broadcast.com, right? Yeah. 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 And it was competitive with Real Player, which also wasn't uh, on demand. That was just mm. no. streamed radio. No, the first on demand was... The first time I saw this, I was like, this is insane. Like, especially for people that are, that are like, you know, learning machines using Charlie's, where it's like, I can go to... Even today. Like they do, you can go to any podcast player, type in whatever you want to learn about, and then you can hear somebody that's usually spent yeah. hundreds of hours teaching you about this stuff. You can also find intellectual, high quality content more easily now because it, all content, because there were a limited number of channels and a limited number of time slots, everything had to be produced for the lowest common denominator. And now you can opt into your niche and find the highest quality content in that niche. Yep. And like, the only way to do that before was books. Like there wasn't an audio way to, f there wasn't content. There wasn't niche audio content broadly available. And there weren't, there aren't business, like several million authors out there, right. but there's several million podcasters. Right. Well, you made a good, you were, I think you were getting to a good point. It's like, because the business model didn't support that. And so now- And there was no distribution. Yeah, and now with podcasting, it's like, you guys, you know, I'm sure, I think like 50, I don't ever look at analytics, but I think last time I looked, it was like 50% of my audience was in the United States, but then, Everywhere. And I, so I was doing, the early days of Founders, I was just, I remember it all changed because I couldn't figure out um, the business model. So you would do like affiliate, you know, at that time, I remember when I first started. Yeah, you went through a bunch of business models. Yeah. So when I first started, they're like, hey, um, you, you, you contact like the few podcast advertising networks there were back then, you know, because you guys started your show in 2016, right? 15. 15. Okay. So I started in 2016. And you contact me, like, yeah, we can do ads for your show. Uh, you know, you need like 25,000 downloads an episode. And at the time, I'm like, I'll never get there. Right. Like, obviously, we've skyrocketed past that. But like, I was like, that's a fuck, that's impossible. That's like as many people as in a basketball arena. <laughs> oh, when you start visualizing the audience, oh, yeah. it's like, oh, two and a half NFL stadiums show up for every acquired episode. Like, that's an insane. Yes. But do you guys think, so do you guys but think about that? Uh, only in, in uh, adding to the pressure in a good way. Like, it's a good motivator. I like, never think about it. Really? You know what I think about it? How my show set up is why I say you and I and I yeah, try yeah, to yeah. It's like right. I picture, I like how you treat the audience as like the person you're It's eating. one person. So yeah. like one and I've done this forever. It's like I it's funny. I remember it's one of my friends. 
that we were met up one day and I was like, man, I think I'm going to try to make like a business around the fact that I read so much. And he's like, and he called me like a year, like six months ago, a year ago. He's like, I can't believe you did that. <laughs> Cause he's like, I thought you were, that was the dumbest thing I ever heard. But I just picture him when I started, it's like, oh, uh, the whole f- idea behind the show was like, what if you got to meet up once a week with your friend that reads a lot and he just tells you the stuff that he read that week, like interesting ideas. And so did I even cross your person. mind to like try and convince him to do the podcast with you or somebody no, else or never. you were all just like, no, I'm going to. So one, th- one thing, we don't have like a bunch of prepared stuff, but one thing us three talked about, it's like, hey, why don't we talk about like, who was your influence on why you do what you do? And so I feel the greatest uh, podcaster of all time is Dan Carlin from Hardcore History. That's like my, f- I think he's like, I can't believe what that guy does, right? Y- you and him are like the only successful uh, monologue podcasters. Like, I think it's the hardest thing to do in this medium. And I can't, I mean, there's, everyone else either has a guest on or a co-host. Yeah. Um, well, there's another guy that was, uh, that, so I took Dan Carlin and I was like, I was obsessed with this. I've listened to all his episodes for like years. You were talking about falling asleep. I did that too, but I mm. fell asleep to Dan Carlin. So I over and over and over again to now where I listen to him, I'm like, I, it's like, it's a uh, like Pavlovian. Yeah. I was like, yeah. no, don't wake. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not nighttime, bro. Wake up. <laughs> um, but there was another one uh, that a friend of mine put me on to, there's this comedian named Bill Burr. Mm-hmm. He does the Monday morning podcast. He used to do it every Monday. Now he does, I think Monday and Thursdays, right? He is, one of the first podcasters. When he was podcasting, his his first episodes, at the time, he would do it. He would call into a number and record, right? And then that there was a service that would transform that recording from your phone into an, an a, MP3. A, an MP3 that you could you publish. You could download and put on your this iPod. This is way before like yeah. anything. And it's so, so wild how things have. I mean, you know, we're here now in this recording setup that we have here. You know, with thousands of dollars a gear and like yeah we start I, I remember when we first started i don't think you let me do this but i was like well why don't we just talk at the computer and like set up quick time dude when i listen <laughs> back to our first few episodes like pixar and i'm like we it sounds like we were just talking at the computer yeah <laughs> well, we basically were yeah that's that's when people are like i have a lot of psychos that they're like I'm, i start on number one i go all the way through i was like oh like please don't please yeah, don't. yeah. <laughs> if you're gonna if you're gonna do oh, like things, gonna, go gonna, in the opposite this is one of the things i wanted to talk about <laughs> i i i used to um because that way, at least by the time you get to one, you like, you, you, it, you're a fan. But if you if you start at one, you're like, oh, these guys just, just guys suck. suck. Yeah. But like that, it, it's almost like um, there's great pleasure in hearing something that you think is excellent and fully baked and like, uh, especially when it's been long running, you're like, oh, this has always been immaculate and perfect. And then you get to go see some of the early work, and you're like. Oh, it's, it's so. Like you were talking it's about. So you want to go. Like, you want the early Charlie. I, I get the. I can see where the magic was, even though they didn't know yet. Like the. It's the, the same the, thing the you see in the there. books that you're reading, though. Like yeah. Sam Walton, when you tell a story where his his landlord screws him over, and he goes, he goes, I'm not whipped. I I found the, I found the store. I'll, I'll do it again. Right. Yeah. And it's like, yes, Walmart is a huge success. You guys made the point that there was a great point where it's like you're never gonna think 25 years in the future when there's watermelons and donkey crap on the ground, that this is going to be the richest family in the world, right? If you, right. If you And the most a, standardized form of retail. Yeah. but And so you see like, oh, he that same guy that became the richest person in the world, that his now family has a rich family or whatever, it's like he is imperfect too, just like I am. And so that is the only benefit of listening to an early acquired or an early mm-hmm. founder is like, oh, you see the improvement. Just like in the books, yeah. you see the well, improvement. Well, it's fun too. Like I like going back and listening to some of your old episodes. Yeah. Like, I get to like see your journey. You know, like yeah. it's like I'm proud of you. Yeah. Like right. the uh, but the, I, I've been thinking about that. And I was thinking about ahead of our conversation here. Like I used to say all the time, people are like, oh, I go back, I listen to the early episodes. I'm like, no, don't. It's so embarrassing. I actually think like we always want to be embarrassed by our last episode. We've just constantly kept like Raising the every bar. episode, like we try and just notch it up. Because we keep and, like, picturing the stadium, and right. we're like, "That's that's the like that's why I think about the stadium because I think about the like the pressure of like we got to do better next time than we did this time." And it's not just filled with like you know Seattle's NFL fans; it's filled with like hundreds of thousands of the smartest people that. And this gets to like the psyche, like the the the, the deep insecurities that at least I have of like I want to impress those people. I want those people to think I'm smart. And so I have to produce something unbelievably worthwhile of their time. Mm-hmm. And the minute that I don't, I'm like literally walking out in front of an NFL f- stadium full of people that I want to impress and looking like a it's, dumbass. It's like a version of the, you know, the uh, the old, um, you didn't prepare for the test in high school nightmare. Or like That's exactly, you, yeah. yeah. 
And like, I didn't used to have that pressure, but like once we found content market fit for acquired with like people that I've always thought highly of, that's true. That, that, that I think is the we driver did, now. There were a couple years where we kind of drifted. There wasn't that pressure to keep amping the bar. Yep. And then you're right. It's like the 2017 it, yeah. era. Yeah. yeah. I think you're never going to be embarrassed about your your latest episode at the time we're making this is LVMH. You're never going to be embarrassed about that. That was excellent. And like, that was it, it, it doesn't mean fun. you can't keep improving 10 years from now. I, but no, like I look back at that. Yeah. I think like, uh, yes, that's certainly an episode. I don't know how you feel, but that like I'm proud of. But I look back, like I at the time, like, so we didn't know that was going to be a yeah, super popular episode. Yeah, that was totally unpredictable. It's our, it's our, it's our, uh, because we haven't shared this publicly yet, it's our our number one episode by a huge margin. 40,000 more people have listened to that episode than the next highest, which yeah. was Amazon.com. That's I incredible. probably could have told you, actually, I was like, David, no one's going to listen to Amazon because everyone already knows this story, which was super wrong. But I, I either thought like, no one will listen to this one or like, this will be our most successful episode. With LVMH, even after we recorded it, I was like, or after we edited it, because we had to like edit a lot of stuff. This but is, I, I was like, "This is funny. This is this how is much we didn't good, know." But it's uh, not we like were... our best ever. But apparently, yeah, it was, I think it, it might be my favorite ever. episode of yours. Oh. And I heard from a ton of other people that how much they liked it. Like, it's well, thank you. It's but, really but good. to the, but to the conversation, it. like, there's a bunch of stuff that we could have done better in that episode, like a whole bunch. So I do this all the time where like, I'll go back and listen to old episodes because people are like, that's weird you listen to a podcast. It's like, no, this is a tool. That's how you get better. This is Game a tool. footage. No, we didn't even try to get better. It's like, I was like, oh, I haven't read that book in like two years. I'll just listen to my episode on it. And it like, serves <laughs> as a, it's a tool for me. That's how I know it's good for other people, right? right? And so I was like, and then I'll listen to it. I'm like, oh wow, I forgot that. I need to keep that idea in my mind, except, but I'll hear myself like, oh, you said that in two paragraphs, that could have been one paragraph, cut that part, that doesn't yep. make sense. And so, yeah, I understand the improvement, but what I'm saying is your quality is already super high. Like it can increase and get better, don't get me wrong, but like you're never gonna be embarrassed. You're just like, oh, I could probably do it a 20%, 30% better, which is still excellent from the, 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 like the level you're at. So the way that we edit is our editor takes the first pass and he's unbelievably good and that, that's, we're so lucky to have him. And then he sends us a rough cut I upload it to Descript, and then we listen like and, and read while we're listening, word for word, sentence for sentence, and try to cut every unnecessary sentence. And we end up pulling out 20-ish minutes of like just fluff. It's just like, okay, we could have been tighter in that point. Can, is there a way to get tighter in it without re-recording it? And I think that has dramatically contributed to episode quality, because by the time we ship it, neither of us feel that there are extraneous sentences. All right, it is time to tell you about one of our favorite companies and returning sponsor, Vouch, the insurance of tech. Vouch is the fastest way to insure your startup when you're first getting started and the right way to insure your company as you scale. Vouch is the insurer recommended by Carta, Brex, Vanta, and more. And they are our insurer here on Acquired. That's true. In this season, we're doing something new with Vouch. We are going to dive deep specifically into the nuts and bolts of how buying the right insurance for your company works so you can be a smarter customer no matter who you choose to work with. And we are going to be doing a different one of these every episode this season. So we all know that we are working through a cyclical reset of the entire VC-backed technology industry. And in this reset, managing risk is hugely important. Any unexpected events that hit your company, you just have way less cushion to recover than you used to when money was much more free-flowing. It used to be that the most expensive mistake you could make was not to raise enough money. The market has changed, and many of us are now focused on sustainable growth, profitability, and importantly, predictable forecasting. The core skill of any entrepreneur is still to evaluate risks and allocate resources to maximize the probability of success. But in this environment, that especially means taking insurance seriously. Insurance is a critical safety net for your business and a signal to your investors, your team, and just as importantly to your customers that you are meeting this moment responsibly. So if you're an early stage company, you can buy Vouch Insurance online in just 10 minutes just like we did. It is a great digital experience and insurance advisors are standing by if you have questions. If you're a founder listening right now and you don't have insurance yet, just like press pause, <laughs> go get it off your to-do list, do it right now, go to Vouch. It's typically only a few hundred bucks for a year of coverage. 
And this is something we didn't talk about the last time Vouch was a sponsor. If you work at a larger company, like Series B, C, or beyond, your needs are different. And this is where Vouch has actually gained a ton of product functionality and sophistication as a team over the last few years. They now have a dedicated scale team that engages you and your company to understand your needs and offer a coverage recommendation, including a detailed quote and risk management guidance. They also, as you would imagine, have a full brokerage and can source any coverage on the market at exceptional value. Actually, David and I did this because we bought some specialty media insurance and Vouch obviously doesn't have that in-house and helped us find the right coverage. It really is changing the game for growth stage companies the same way they did for early stage a few years back. And so Vouch is proud to serve clients like Neighbor, Middesk, and of course, Acquired itself. We are proud to spend this season after this episode kind of diving specifically into the nuts and bolts of how purchasing insurance actually works, what it's used for, all that stuff. So you can click the link in the show notes and save 10% on your first year at vouch.us slash acquired. Thanks, Vouch. So I don't know if I'm like that. Like you're still a one man show, right? Like you, I do everything. No one touches anything. So like everything. So, Soup to nuts. I'm gonna ask your question, but I also think like we should. This is a perfect uh, point to like how we became friends and why. Like I'm putting this out on my feed, and no one, no one. You're gonna be the first non David Senra voices that I ever heard on Founders, and they only would agree to do it. And I only agree to do it with you guys is because like this goes back to like why. I want to be surrounded with, first of all, people that have like interest, su- super smart people, but also people that have like positive some thinking, right? Patrick O'Shaughnessy has this gigantic successful show, uh, invest like the best. He's got the Colossus Podcast Network. His fund is called Positive Sum, and that's how he acts. I joined his network. This is like months later. Um, and they're like, hey, like, like, you know, we have editors, whatever. Like he has like this empire over there. Yeah. And resources, he's like, what do you want? And I was like, uh, I just want you to amplify my audience and then connect me with first first rate advertisers because like I think acquired is a luxury podcast not maybe not luxury premium we got to go over the distinction Ooh, there yeah, yeah, from yeah. LVMH but like we're not building like run of the mill shit like we are we're saying no no this is like we're trying to set the bar here but anyways he's like hey do you want editors you want any of this stuff I was like no I don't want no one gets to touch my stuff <laughs> like people think oh like does do they tell you what books to read and like no Patrick liked my show. And he's just like, why would I tell you? Like, just whatever you're doing, yeah. just do it to more people now. Um, and so to answer your question, no, like I pick the books, I record them, I edit, I'm still a one-person show. I don't know if that'll happen forever, but I do think the fact that it just ha- like spend so much time with the material gets it in my brain. But the reason that, uh, like, I want to talk about like the role you guys played in that, where we were getting on Zoom and for like the background here is like, you know, we had known of each other. I talked to Ben a long time ago because he was running this oh, this private right. podcast. This is like years ago. Um, and so anyways, we're like... They're, you're, that's also funny to think back. Like all the dead ends that we went... Like we went down a ton of them. You went down a ton of them. You're about to talk about some of them. Like there's so many dead ends. But they're in the books too. Yeah, but they're like, in the books. That's, that's exactly... Yeah, yeah, we changed just, the name of the show to Adapting? Oh my God, that was that was Whoa. a dead end. That was on me. That one was on me. Tell the story. Oh, <laughs> COVID happened and we were like, no one wants to hear these oh, like man. stories of like extreme capitalism. Like we, we're like the X Games of capitalism. And, and like this is a, a, a <laughs> moment where like... <laughs> Capitalism. Everyone is hurting. Zero business, and like this is in that the stock market trough too, where you're just like, wow, like you know, all businesses are going to go under. Yeah. All, no one's ever going to have jobs again. This is you know, this is scary. And so we were like, well, like, what story should we tell? How about businesses that are adapting to make it through this tough time? And to like show how serious we were about it, we changed the name of the show. It was like our three least listened to episodes, uh, covering a pretty amazing yeah. stories, but we just branded it wrong. Like totally. Canlis is like the most interesting restaurant story you could ever hear about. Yep. And like we did Intel. That's the only time we've ever done Intel. That's the only but time we've done Intel. But because it was adapting, not yep. a quite, it was stupid. It was so like, stupid. But you, lo- there's no way to do like oh, learn so. uh, rather than do you screw wanna, up. Do you want to know the first name of founders? Ooh. You know, like Ooh. in your RSS feed, you can change the name, right? But you can't change the the link. Like the, it'll still the say. URL, yeah. So you look at it from mine, and it's Autotelic. The worst name. Autotelic comes from this How book do you called even Flow. Spell that? A-U-T-O-T-E-L-I-C, maybe. I don't know. I can't spell for I can't spell, pronounce. I have no grammar. So I, it'd be like, you read so much. I was like, I don't pay attention to any of that stuff. Is that the Mi- Mihai? Uh, yes. The guy that Flow. Mihai? Yes. It's, it is an activity that you do for the sake of itself. Going back to your questions, like why, like... 
I just love to read. I'm going to do this if no one listens. Like, that's how I know I'm going to win. Because it's like, people are like, oh, would you do it for free? It's like, I, no, no, I paid to do this. Like, for like a long time. For a long time. Like, I literally said I'm going to quit and I'm going to, I have the savings. I have a wife and a baby or a daughter to support. Now I have a son, a wife, a daughter, and a son. And I was like, I bet you, I, I just put trust in myself. It's just like, I'm going to, if I focus on this seven days a week, I'll figure out the business model. I know, like, I don't think I'll ever get rich from it, but I will at least pay my bills, right? And so, like, every month I'm like, oh, less money there. And like, so I pay to do it. So the idea where, like, uh, you know, again, people get, I think Steve Jobs talks about this, like, the older he gets, he said something like, the older he gets, the more he realizes why people do things matters. And so he's always asking those yeah. questions. Like, I always say, it's like, how do you know uh, that you found what you love to do? And uh, people are like, oh, because, like, I wouldn't sell my company. It's like, okay, there's another level. It's like, how much would you have had to pay Steve Jobs to stop working at Apple? The answer is, he wouldn't take all the money in the world. How, how, how much would you have to pay Charlie Munger? A lot of people yeah. tried to stop Steve Jobs yeah. from working at Apple. <laughs> yeah, but like, think about that. Like, the idea is like, he's not doing it for money. He's in a different game. He's doing it for yeah. the sake of itself. And so I went through a bunch of different names. Uh, history's Greatest Men, History's Greatest, like history, all this, these terrible names. And I just started narrowing it more and more and more to like founders. And I was like, oh, that's perfect. There is a Because you weren't even, like, you, didn't, you weren't coming from the tech world. You weren't like, no, there's a, this wasn't content marketing. No, no, this there, is like, no you know. th it was just like, uh, the, the idea I had known about like Warren Buffett, Elon Musk, and all these other people. And I remember you had Kevin Rose on your show a long time ago. So you guys remember his, he had, if he was Again, not that long ago, maybe a year, year and a half. Yeah. Yeah, it just time flies. Because it was post, it was, he was, he was, was uh, during COVID. It, he, he was pretty much already fully Web3 by the yeah. time we. So do you guys remember Foundation? Yeah, of course. Oh, he's yeah. like one oh. of the first high Dang. quality. Yeah. Inter like imagine if he would have stuck with that show. Like, you know, know what I mean? Like I it would have been a right. monster. And it's like the, uh, the only episodes that ever came out was like, here's me interviewing Elon Musk. Here's me interviewing Sam Altman. Here's me. And like these people, and also before they became like icons Elon had the of Model our time. S. That's it. Elon had the model. That was the only thing. He was just about to release the, the Model S. The yeah. He had the Roadster. No, no, he, the they were thing. in the factory because I watched it. I watched it all the time. They were in the factory building the Model S. That's right. So it was. I don't know if you could huh. buy it yet, but it was like coming or whatever. Uh. And Elon looks way younger and like you know. And then in 2015, Tim Ferriss. I was a big fan of his podcast. I read like you know, Four Hour Work yep. Week. Yep. I remember the way I just Four Hour Body changed my life. Did it? Yeah. With its low carb. Yep. Slow I, carb diet. I did that too. Slow carb <laughs> diet. Cold showers. Like I did. And the funniest <laughs> the thing is like that, that's is like the, this whole cold plunge thing that's like becoming a thing now. I'm like, was nobody like reading Tim Ferriss in 2011? Yeah. Oh, like that were. was a huge part of. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it it's goes just back. Only our demographic was. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that that made me think of something. Let me interrupt this story because I think it's really important. You're like, oh, is anyone going to listen to our? Like, no one's going to listen to our Amazon episode. They already know it. And so this is something that like, oh, and then it becomes the are, most successful. Are you going to quote Ogilvy? Yes. Yes. Yeah, Hundred percent. Listen to enough founders to know. Yeah, because it's like this is so key that people don't understand. It's like you're not advertising to standing army. You're advertising to moving parade. And so, like, I will literally get on calls with, like, media company founders that are, like, selling ads or, like, building companies. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you must have read Ogilvy. They're like, what? And I was like, these are not new lessons. Like, if, if and again, this comes from the humility to realize, hey, Warren Buffett's smarter than me. So if that dude in his shareholder letters is saying, uh, David Ogilvy's a genius, I'm like, wait a minute. This dude, how many businesses has Warren Buffett looked at at that point? How many founders and managers has he looked at? And he's like, this dude's a genius. Yeah. This is not rocket science, right. guys. Just go and like, <laughs> let's search David Ogilvy and Amazon. Five books, good. Order them and these all. These days, it search David Ogilvy and your podcast yeah. player of choice. Like, um, that's I, I went to wait, three. but explain the the standing army versus. So you're not advertising to uh, standing army. You're advertising to moving parade. But what happens is like even when you put on uh, the Sequoia episode, right? We went, me and David went on a hike in Stanford, and I was like, dude, you have this crazy back catalog. Every single day, you have more people following your podcast feed than you had the day before. I was like, and I, because I knew this because I was a subscription podcast, right? Recount briefly your business model journey. So I, I'll give you the shorter breakdown because like I went through so many of them. I just put a hard paywall, listen to the first 30 minutes. You want to listen to all of them. Um, then you pay, right? And it converts. This is when we had that chat that you yes, were talking about. We got to we go back like, to that. We were like, 
dude, you're doing do it wrong. Not, you do, there, you're doing it wrong. Yeah, because the, there's been times like this one where we're like, what the hell are you doing? But there's been other times where you come to us and you're like, do you know how good your Sequoia episodes were? And like the fact that you have four times the audience that you have now and right. none of the 75% of those people have ever heard the Sequoia episode, what are you doing? And so you guys, we had this hike. The, the, this is Ogilvy idea. Remember, not my yeah. idea. I don't get like... Everything has already been done, guys. Just pay, and I'm speaking to the people listening, not you. You obviously know it's like they've already been done. Just go see. Hey, that person's smart. Let me see some shit that he learned from 40 year career. Like you're not gonna you're, the idea yeah. is you're not gonna pick up an idea you can use as silly. So I told I do David. Think, though, I was thinking about this. There's some cases where it's it's not true, but I think most truly like iconic world changing businesses and founders. They build, they stand on the shoulders of giants, but they have one or multiple things that is novel that they come up with. It's the combination of these ideas, like Sam Walton taking Soul Price's ideas and his competitors' ideas, and like, hey, what about you guys are kind of ignoring these like four thousand person com- uh, communities? I'm pretty sure, like, the thesis behind Walmart is like, will they just drive far distances just to save money? Right. Uh, the answer is yes. Right. Five right, right, hours. Right, right. But that that yeah. like that is a, a novel idea. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. a very it's that's it's, the whole thing. It's, it's, like, it's combining like one big novel idea with a bunch of other things that yeah. you, you can guys learn combined from David Ogre's idea by republishing your Sakura podcast, and then you text me, you're like, oh my god, like the downloads are crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and because the vast majority because you're not podcasting to a standing army or podcasting to a moving parade. And so I had known this because through my experimentation, I would take an old episode that I had done, uh, do a preview, throw it up, and you'd get conversions every time because it was new to them. And that was like, so Ogilvy, I credit Ogilvy with that idea. That's an idea he got from Claude Hopkins and Albert Lasker who were building advertising businesses 50 years before him. Is this uh, scientific advertising? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Also a good founders episode. Yeah. He's excellent. That, 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 um, that book, Scientific Advertising, sold like eight or 10 million copies. They kept it in Albert Lasker. So Claude Hopkins worked for Albert Lasker. Claude, Albert Lasker thought the book was so good, he stored it in a vault. He wouldn't let, <laughs> and he's like, he built. Because it was like the secrets of the industry, right? Like, don't publish this because we don't want this getting out. I've learned that because in Ogilvy and Advertising, at the very end of the book, David's like, here, these are the six giants that I learned from. So I was like, oh, okay, well, then I'm going to Google search. Who's the, like, right. I'm going to read the book. This is not rocket science again. So then he's like, oh, Albert Lasker made more money than anybody in, than anybody else in the history of the advertising business. I was like, hold up. What? How? Also, like, none of us know this guy's that. name. Yeah. yeah. And so then then you realize it's like, he, he says in the book, he's like, his estate outside of Chicago was so big, he had 40 full-time employees. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Like, that, make these words make sense in my mind. That doesn't make any sense to me. So then you read Albert Lasker. And then he tells you about Claude Hopkins. He's like, yeah, the, the information was so good that like I stored that in my vault for 20 years. And then once he sold his uh, advertising, uh, or I think he gave it away like a token, like $100,000, you know, to the people working uh, there. Hmm. And then they released it and Claude went off on his own and, and everything else. So these are not like... Yeah. Okay. So you were doing the 30 minute hard cutoff when we... And so when when it's so unsatisfying. It's like, I'm going to listen to 30 minutes of this episode and then like... I just have to get someone's asking but me to pay have for the rest. Conversion, right? The conversion rates were higher, but you of guys course. said th- th- this is where you're like, at a local maximum. This is where like you were very helpful. Like David, first of all, and you guys are nice. This is not the language you use. You're like you fucking idiot. Like that's, how, that's <laughs> like. And, but you guys are so nice. So it's like, dude, you're doing it wrong. Listen, for every one person, I think it was Ben that said this. It's like for every one person that would buy a podcast, there's a thousand or a hundred that would listen to him for free. Like just it's about a hundred. Yeah, probably even more than that. You know. And so then you guys would show me like you open the kimono. You're like, this is these are our downloads. This is who we advertise with. This is what we charge for advertising. You just like, well, the other the other really key insight is uh, so after spending a bunch of time with originally Kimberlite, then Glow, which yeah. got sold to Libsyn, and still what powers the acquired LP program. Uh, an interesting learning is most podcasts should generate about fifty percent of their revenue from direct monetization, some kind of membership program, or paywalling their feed. Um, and about half from advertising. And, and it should, the math should sort of work out where that's going to be the case. For the type of podcast that we are, where you have lots of founders and CEOs and hedge fund managers and these the sorts of people listening, you, you could never ask someone to pay you in membership what they are worth to the most valuable advertiser for that slot. And so the way it sort of works out is like you're massively hamstringing your monetization potential if you make it membership only because you'd have to be like, uh, yes, please pay two to five thousand dollars a year in order to get access to this private thing. Versus, if you were to 
take that same piece of content and open it up to advertisers. You made the great, the good point earlier, and we can elaborate on that, right? Why you're so psychotic about this sentence is, needs to get out of here, like these two sentences, let's, let's remove it. Because if you could factor in the average hourly rate of the people in your audience, it is unbelievable. So even I think if you make, what, a million dollars a year, and we know people obviously in our audiences make a lot more than that, but I think a million dollars a year is what, 500 bucks an hour or something like that? I don't know the math, Sounds I'm right. not a good math person. But like, so you're asking if they listen to an hour long podcast of founders, it's like, that's $500. Like you cannot waste these yeah. people's time. So I never answer your question when you're like, hey, how do you guys think about this? Do you, do you re-edit or do you cut them out? I use the script as well. I actually think the way I listen to founders is obviously listening to it and listening and reading. Like the super yeah. power of podcasts is you can listen to it when you're doing something else. But, but when you're editing, but I though, think I'm going to put all the, my ad, all my podcasts up on YouTube. Not I don't have any video, but I think I'm going to use the script. So like if you there is mm. like some people have success just putting up the audio on audio uh, like a, st a static picture, and you can listen to it on YouTube. Yep. But I also think I was like, well, if I'm going to do that, I might as well just mm, I have this, right. and that's kind of cool if you want to use it but don't have to. We, we did not find success doing that. Like this episode will be the first episode this year that's on YouTube because we basically said if there's not interesting video, then it's not a video podcast, and you can go find it in a podcast player. I. It's, I'm using it just for search and yeah, that's, I would that's use smart it. That's, I'm, not, I'm never going to, I don't think I'm ever going to do video anything because it's just like, it's so much simpler to do. Literally what I'm saying is like, I'm going to upload the MP3 to YouTube. Like I'm not making a video just because it is, they're eventually going to have, they're not stupid. They're eventually going to have like the podcast player inside of YouTube. Like I, yeah. did you, they released this like 40 page document I read on the, their podcast goals hmm. on YouTube. Oh, did I, I send it to you guys? That. No. I'll no. send it to you guys. So right now I have YouTube Premium, so you can listen to them in the background, yeah. like a podcast yeah. player. Which but, is great. But they need to have podcast functionality. It's still like a yeah. video. It's yeah. Me. So anyways, um, the the way I do it is like, yes, I'm very aware that uh, who's listening, I'm not ever going to waste a lot of their time. And what I've found with the more practice I have for the podcast is I'm able to edit on the fly. Like I don't have a script, right? So like I'll go through the book, I highlight, then write down whatever pops to my mind. I don't th like just... Am I, first of all, the highlights are like, am I excited about that? Oh, that's interesting. Highlight. Just go off yep. instinct, right? Yeah. And then write down it, like something that, oh, that's like this, or that made me think of this, and I just write it down, right? Then I'll reread all these highlights the night before I record. Uh, so it's like the second you're do, time. You're doing this in physical books, Physical right? books, yeah. But you're putting your notes into Readwise? That happens after. Okay. That happens after. So the fifth time, every single book I do, I think I read the highlights five times. And the fifth time is me actually taking pictures of the physical book and putting it in Readwise. So Jeff Bezos, I was thinking about this yesterday because um, I'm also sli slightly obsessed with Jeff Bezos. And he You're said, slightly obsessed with a, lo a lot of founders. That's why we were like, <laughs> you're like, we're sitting in chairs like, dude, I'm going to be forward. Yeah, we were setting up the camera <laughs> angles before. Because <laughs> you know what I love? Like, um, we're like, I, we got to move David's chair back here a little <laughs> yeah. bit. Do you ever, if you ever watch the old Jeff Bezos interviews when he's like first starting Amazon, oh, he's like yeah. skinny oh, yeah. and bald, like it's bald. Oh, yeah. The one that's like in that field outside the conference. Yes, I think this is the one he's like sitting, like you see grass on him. I don't know if yes. he's in a field. So, but he like leans forward. He's like, we're going to be the most customer obsessed company ever. It's like, <laughs> and he's got that look yeah, on his yeah. face. That's how like, I am about founders. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like you know, but you're but, like, that dude's a psycho. <laughs> but Jeff says something that he is. But Jeff says something in Invent and Wander, which is an excellent book because it's all of his shareholder letters and yep. transcripts of the speeches. Uh, Walter Isaacson yep. did that, right? Yep. And all of his transcripts of the speeches. And he goes, Do you really want to, co to, to live in a world or to compete against somebody that's, that's as good as you? Like, I certain would, certainly wouldn't. That's what his he states. And he's like, his, if you read his shareholder letters and listen to him talk, he's like, he's constantly looking for unfair advantages. Yep. And I think part of the fact that I have now over 20,000 highlights from hundreds of books, and I still have like 50 or 60 or maybe 80 books I haven't put in there yet that are in my library. So it's like, that's my Readwise account is an unfair advantage because yep. anytime somebody's talking, it's like, I can immediately, like, oh, you said something? I search for that term and it pulls up. And it's like, oh, and then I see my highlight and I see my note. It takes so long. Yeah. Like so long to do that, but it's worth the extra five or 10 hours And that's hours integrated into your process of making values. Yes, because I'm reading something, mm, I remember, mm, no, I know I've seen this before, I can't remember it. Type in that term and it pulls up every single instant. Wow. Instant it's up. like a brain so it's, outside it's your brain. It's an unfair advantage yeah. that I have with me all the time. And well, um, what, what I'll do is like whenever I'm like uh, waiting for an Uber today, right? Uh, just pull up Readwise and it, Readwise has the highlights feed. And I'll show you guys uh, what it looks like. It looks a lot like a Twitter feed, right? Completely random. So I'm not choosing mm. this. And instead of me reading Twitter all day, which uh, is not a good use of your time, it's 
this highlight from the Dodge Brothers. Uh, I haven't read that book. You know, that, that was like episode, you know, probably in like the 115th. Billy Durant, right. who's the founder of GM. Huh. Uh, Sam Colt. And so are these ones that other people have liked a lot? No. So therefore... No. It's just repopulating your own... Yes. Oh, So it's my form of awesome. practice. So you've got... So whoa, let me give you like an example. A healthy Twitter there on your phone. So and is that what, like... How how many times a day? Like how often are you just pulling up Readwise and, and almost going? every day? And if I'm not doing it on Readwise, I'll go to like my bookshelves. So what will happen is, um, you can pull a book off my shelf, and I'm thinking about this for like my kids. Long after I'm gone, my kids can like, what was my dad into? You know, and they can go back and see. Oh, and when he was 35 or 38, this is the podcast he made. Let me go find that book, mm. and then they can pull off the shelf. Like, oh, this is the line he thought was interesting. Oh, wow, you see dad's handwriting here, and like, so I use this for myself, where I can pick up a book and quote unquote read it, reread it in 30 minutes by rereading my highlights and notes, and mm. now I'm like, it's back in back like in front of mine. Um, and then what happens is like, you can do this anytime. Like people are like, oh. I'm running late for lunch. I don't give a shit. Like yeah. I'll just do this or I'll answer DMs or I'll, I always have stuff to do with me, but I use it as a form of practice. The reason I said this is like, it sounds stupid. People think it's maybe, maybe they think it's silly. I don't know. But I read this book. Uh, it's episode 212 of Founders. It's called Michael Jordan, The Life. It's a 600 page biography. And in that book- You just have like this encyclopedia knowledge too of the numbers of your episodes, which I'm so impressed by. I don't, it's only because I reference that all the time. So when, if you look up something over and over again, yeah, 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 it's repetition. Everything in life is repetition. Sam Walton's career is repetition. You know, like, it's like, I just think you're trying to, this is what I asked Charlie. Like he, one of the most interesting things he said, he's like, one of the best things that ever happened to me is I got rich later in life. Mm. You know, like he saw the what time and that? how difficult it was. Like, he was talking about like, um, imagine you being like a uh, super famous or rich when you're like 21 or 25 and how disorienting. He's like, I was a full grown man, like with yeah. life experiences with a wife and kids. Yeah, a child who died. Yeah, I, didn't, I did not you. mention that, yeah. Yeah. Um, but like he had all like, a, you know, full life experience. And therefore also the, the main problem that happens is people don't know. They're like, I was the son of a poor man. Now I'm rich and my kids live in unbelievable amount of wealth and privilege. How do I deal with that? That comes up in the books for hundreds of years. The answer is no one fucking knows, right? <laughs> and so with Charlie though, the benefit is he didn't have a famous last name or a lot of wealth. His kids were like grown. Right. They wouldn't have to deal with that when you're yeah. five or seven or 10. He also gave me some advice that was fascinating. You do that, like, you gotta pay that bill eventually though. Like his grandkids have to... Well, so how do you deal with this though, right? Like right. he's multi-billionaire. Like that's an insane. Right. This I is just, this is a five not, generation. Not problem. only is he a multi-billionaire, he's still, like people like us talk for hours about him. He's like a celebrity. Right? So I um, just read this fantastic book. I like reading obscure books because go back to what Jeff Bezos said: differentiation is survival. So like I'll find like weird books. Like me and Sam were in this weird. I was searching for books for you guys yesterday. I couldn't find any. I will order them and bring them to you because I always bring books. And I was really, we went to three different bookstores. I'm not kidding. Like I you brought energy drinks yeah. instead. <laughs> but no, we literally, like, bless Sam and his patience with me. And like drove me all around Menlo Park and Palo Alto yesterday going to bookstores. Like I was literally <laughs> looking for you guys. What a, what a Like you great... had specific books oh in mind. No, no, no. I like going to use bookstores. And, and then like I think of yeah. how I, my, no. my interpretation of you guys in my mind. And I, I just know if this book is good for that person. Like the, the Charlie Mung or the Henry Flagler book, I knew that was good for Charlie Munger because of what he said. So wow. I don't know what's gonna happen. Now I do have two books picked out for you guys, which I'll send you, but um, they're, not, they're like newer books. But anyways. By the way, that sounds like a great day, driving around with Sam Pinky and yeah. going to bookstores. Like what what, yeah, what, what talk, better day could then, you spend? Also the peninsula is like beautiful, so yeah. like. Yeah, and like, you know, Sam's unbelievably intelligent and like she's got a weird alien brain as I always tell him. Uh, our, fr our mutual friend Mitchell Baldrich, that all three of us know, says uh, Sam has a giga brain. I think he's, he, I think, I think he's, I've heard him say that before. I think yeah, it's yeah. what he said, the, his description of it. Um, but I like obscure books. I read uh, this book that is very hard to find. It's like 300 bucks. Uh, it's called The Invisible Billionaire. Daniel Ludwig uh, was the richest person in the world in the 80s and no one knew who he was. He paid, uh, uh, public relations firm to keep his name out of the papers, <laughs> okay? And Do what your competitors don't. <laughs> yeah, so he's just like, I don't wanna be known. And a lot of his was like, it's like shipping and oil and refining and mining and, and, and all the other stuff. But the author made the point in the book that like how different a million and a billion is, going back to Charlie Munger, oh, right? Yeah. And he goes, uh, a stack of, a uh, million dollars in a stack of $100 bills is like 40 inches, you know? A uh, uh, billion dollars in a stack of $100 bills would be, would be three times taller than the Empire State Building. Yeah. And so like for us, like, oh, that, that guy's kind of rich. It's like, no, the billionaire and millionaires are not in the same category. It's so disorienting. I, I, this is also a thing where like 
the English language has done us a disservice by naming two things that are a thousand times different, very similar yeah. words. It sounds similar. Yeah. So they're not similar at all. What was a lot of people were asking, and like think about all the wealthy people that that Charlie talks to, um, and they're asked like, okay, what do I do with like this wealth with my kids? And it's like, you know, is it if you give your kids a bunch of money? Is it going to demotivate him? And Charlie goes, of course it's going to. <laughs> so he's like, <laughs> but he's like, you know, it's like, again, like this should be obvious to you. So he says, I don't try to steer his kids or his grandkids into what they should do for a living, which is Charlie Munger's, one of his best piece of advice that I took to heart. It's like, follow your natural drift. Yeah. Like how I pick books. There's been like 15 or 20 that I've read completely or half. And it's like, I don't like this book. I'm not making an episode about it. it I, I go to my bookshelf and I have like probably 80 or 100 books I haven't read yet. Most come from the audience. And I was like, what am I most excited to, to learn about now? Yep. And that's how I pick it, right? So following Natural Drift. Which is like, also more or less how we pick episodes, too. We have a little bit more planning because now, like, there's such long lead times. But it's kind of like, what's interesting to us right now? Yeah, 100%. Very so emotional. he's like, you know, don't try to steer them too much. And he's like, he definitely feels that they're, some of them are going to be less motivated because they're born rich. But he said this was the most surprising thing. But he goes, you have to give them the money anyways or they're going to hate you for it. <laughs> and I was like, that's like, because my answer insightful. before this, I've read so many like family dynasty stories. And I'm right. not saying I'm trying to build a dynasty. Where they decide we're not going to give the money. Or no, them. they did and it ruined them. Like, mm. did you guys, you guys haven't done an episode that's on common um, case. TCI, John, John not yet. Malone, no, Cable Cowboy? Yeah. That's like, it, in, that will happen this year. For sure. So you know why? Um, th that was one of the books that was recommended the most. They're like, you got to do Cable Cowboy, you got to do Cable Cowboy, you got to do Cable Cowboy. We both have read the book. It's awesome. It's excellent. And there's, so you know the story I'm about to tell you where the crazy thing is like, I'm always thinking about, I didn't understand this before studying, dedicating my life to studying history, right? Where it's like, oh, wow, the decisions I'm making now can, can reverberate through the generations. That's a crazy thing where if Bob Magnus, which is the founder of TCI, this, mm -hmm. you know, yep. um, he doesn't have any monies and rural Texas wants to do this, jump into this new industry cable, right? Full of cowboys, like literal cowboys. Literally. And he doesn't have money. So his dad gives him a $2,500 loan. So Bob takes that $2,500 loan and then let's say 40 years later, Bob dies and he's got to pass on his money, right? That was created from the company he created to his two kids. And he winds up giving them, I think, I don't know the numbers. I want to say like 200 million each, two sons. So think about that one decision. I think I talked about in the episode and if I didn't, it's a big mess up on my part. And I stopped in that part. I'm pretty sure like, you did. I was like, hold on. Think about that. Like, what if his dad didn't give him the twenty five hundred? Yeah, he's like, talking about that. Yeah, so his twenty five hundred dollars turns into four hundred million. Let's say two hundred million each for his grandsons. Change his grandsons' lives. Right. See, so that um, means you, rule of thumb: you take like I don't know, you probably have three more generations after that of wealth guaranteed. That before wealth they... is gone because I think it went up their nose. Mm -hmm. Like that was the, the, the so it's pretty hard in one generation. To... But they, I don't know. Like the point was it's like they that wasn't good for them because they were not motivated they did a bunch of drugs i think they went to jail like that kind of stuff and you mm -hmm. see that so much so my thought was like oh like get them a little bit but not enough that they don't have to work or whatever and charlie's like they're gonna hate you yeah and like mm -hmm. what's That's the point so, such a good insight like, it's just yeah. like human nature this yeah. is my biggest takeaway from charlie and i think the biggest benefit that people that listen to founders and acquired and then hopefully read a bunch of the books and do studying on their own are going to realize this is like Charlie, I said it at the top of my notes, and this is the first thing. It's just like, it's comforting. The conversation I had with Charlie was comforting the same way that people tell me listening to founders is comforting. Is like, Charlie has an almost complete indifference to problems. Troubles from time to time should be expected. This is inescapable, so why would you let it bother you? And the difference, and, and if you think about, that's the main takeaway from the, this three-hour dinner I had with him, right? And if you think about how does he avoid this? He avoids it by great things have less problems. You're never going to escape problems. But mm -hmm. if you're around great people, yep. like they're not going to throw up, just like a great business doesn't throw up big problem after big problem after big problem. Your your wife, your kids, yep. your friends, your coworkers, his whole thing is aim for the highest quality you can get. And then that's going to solve 99% of your problems. And then when you have the problem, the inevitable problems are still going to come. Okay, you just deal with it. Yep. Right. He talked about like when he lost the money on Alibaba, he brought that up, you know, that people try to make fun of him for or whatever. Yeah. It's like, you guys are missing the point. Like, you're not going to escape, get through life without making mistakes. The, the founder of Ikea has this great quote where he says, uh, um, making mistakes is the privilege of the active. Only those asleep make no mistakes. Yeah. 
It's a version of the man in the marine, uh, man in the arena. Yeah, the, yeah, the uh, Teddy Roosevelt idea. idea. Yeah. So, so okay. So, what do you think is the ideal way to handle it if at thirty five someone becomes very wealthy, and so when their their kids' memory starts around age three, so for their entire kids' memorable lifetime, they've grown up in wealth and privilege. Like, how does one handle that? I have no idea. I have no idea. Like, I don't the the. Me even giving you an answer to that is like, uh, there's this guy named Charles Kettering or Kettering. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Uh, I read his biography. I think it's episode 127 or something like that. So he invented the electric uh, starter. He founded AC Delco. That gets acquired by GM. Oh, right. He is the head of research and development at GM when GM is the most valuable company and most like the, the cutting edge of technology company in the world at the time. There's a story from his wife and his daughter in that book uh, saying, hey, when he dies, there's only one. There's only gonna be three words on his um, on his tombstone. I don't know, because that's what he would say over and over and over again. And yeah. one, there's a. He's having this conversation. Same thing. He was the son of a poor man. He is now a rich man. His kids are rich. He's talking to other people that had the same experience. His peers. They're like, what do you do? And the answer they came up with, no. I don't know. Yeah. Because it's so dependent on who the person is. Right. Like, maybe you give them money that going to Bob Magnus's grandsons. Maybe they're you know. They're like Warren Buffett's kids where like they, they run foundations and they want to give the money away. And I don't think they're Coke addicts. I don't know. But like you don't, it's just dependent on the person. So I, if there was a simple, if there was a correct answer, I think some of these guys, some of these would've guys and gals would have right. figured it out. Well, that's the thing about humans, right? Like every person is different. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I have no idea. Um, it, really, and that's the biggest thing where I think um, this is one of the lessons I learned from the podcast where, you know, you mentioned this at the beginning, Ben where most of these people are just so, they're like best in class in this one dimension in the world. And of course, to get that, they had to to be poor. They had to, they couldn't optimize all other areas of the life at, the, at what they did for like their work, right? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. Sam Walton is one of the rare guys where he gets to the end. He knows he's dying because he's got cancer all over his body when he's writing that book. Yep. And he's like, listen, if I could do everything again, he's like, yeah, I missed some of my kids' childhood. They worked in the stores and he took them with him. But he's like, I'd do it again. It's like, I had to do this. I had to get after it. I had to improve. A lot of them, you know, get to the end of their life and like, oh, I, I regret. The founder of Ikea has the best words on this. He said, um, you know, I had three sons growing up. He started Ikea when he was like 17, worked on it until he was like 80 something. And he's like, I sacrificed my three sons' childhoods. I regret it. He goes, it's anybody that has kids knows that childhood does not allow itself to be reconquered. Um, and so like we were hanging out today. We were going to do a recording, go to dinner. And I was... My plan was I was I want to see my son. He's like and my daughter. It's like I'm gonna take the red eye, and then I realized it's like yeah, but I want to spend time with David and Ben, so I'm leaving early tomorrow morning. But it's like I'm doing this as fast as possible, and if I had to, I'd like fly back and forth because like your kids are think about like you, the relationship you yeah. guys have with your parents are, are they still alive? Yep. Yep. Okay. So you get to talk to them, see them, but you have your whole life, right? Right. When your kids are small, there's like this tiny window when they're like two to five to six where you're everything to them oh yeah even like you, you and i've talked about it. i yeah. absolutely feel this way even my 10 year old daughter like right now she wants to spend time with me like it was the cutest thing ever um i was leaving going to la to see charlie and then coming up to san francisco to see you guys and she texts me she goes uh i'm wearing your sweater because like it makes me feel close to you like Aww. while you're gone you know what i mean but if you ask her do you want to spend movie night with dad and mom or do you want to go play roblox with your friends Every, For sure, the they're friends, and she yeah. loves me. Don't get me wrong, but like their their friends are way they're really important to them. Yeah, where like every day I miss my son's about to turn three. It's like I'm not gonna get back that day, and yeah. there's only like a thousand mm. of those days. Yeah, and my wife won't have any more kids, even though I was like, I don't want a bunch of kids. Like, what's that? <laughs> yeah, like, Charlie. I was like, I want a bunch, and she's like, No way. I say, like, Hey, you're the, I don't have to get pregnant, so that's fine. Something that Buffett and Munger did with the Graham Group that like was way ahead of its time that now anybody can do is they formed their social networks outside of geographic barriers yeah. and they found their like most compatible, most like-minded, highest level of talent, you know, peers. Mm-hmm. And then they just like got on planes and got to go see them, you know, and like that was really hard to do back in the day. And now anybody can do it. It's kind of like the Bill Gurley, you know, you have no excuse not to do that. You also, but here's the thing, what people get wrong is they're like, oh, I want to meet this guy. You have to do the work necessary to make them worth your time. 
right? Which is like the unfair advantage that the three people sitting in this room have mm -hmm. is that it doesn't matter. That's why I've, like in the last six weeks, I've gone to lunch or dinner with multiple billionaires. This is like, and the people that like you get to talk to and all this stuff is like, this dude is crazy. He's read 300 biographies of entrepreneurs. There's no way I'm going to have dinner with him and not pick up one idea. Yep. Like, and then now I've built this machine where like, oh, that's an interesting idea. I'll just plug it into this business. And like, it's not a financial transaction by any means, but there's no, I, the reason it's not that like, Charlie was the first person I met that I was actually nervous about. And it's the reason I'm not nervous is because I know I've done the work. Like yeah. you can't put yeah. me in a room with anybody on the fucking planet and I'm not gonna be able to tell them at least one interesting thing. Yeah. It doesn't mean I'll be the most, the best dinner they've ever had in their life. That's not what I'm saying. It's just like, they're gonna hear something that's like, oh, that's interesting. And like goes to their own brain. And it's only because I've spent six years and, and same with you guys. It's like, oh, you should feel comfortable. Like you guys mentioned earlier, it's like, um, the, the, your audience feels like, you know, two football fields and like, oh, it's a little bit of like, uh, not, you didn't use the word insecurity, but like, you know, a little like nervousness. I want these people to like, like me. It's just yeah. like, oh, yeah. you know it's like, it's like, you it's like you a fear pushing you from behind. But you know, like you've most likely read, you, you're, you're, you know more about the subject than they do. Sure, oh, I do, yeah. but I need to make something worthy of their time. Yes, that is an admirable, you it's know. It's like, I could, who cares? I could spend all the time in the world and fail to synthesize the narrative and the takeaways and all of a sudden then I've just, you know, th then I've failed them. It, it, regardless yeah. of how much work I did, I, the, the product wasn't good. And so that, that's, that's the thing. It's that, hard to not have the product be good because you did the work, I guess is my point. We, yeah, I think we now have a process that uh, means that when you and I put in the work, the, pro the product is good, but it took a long time to, to arrive at that. It's almost like... Um, uh, you know, the, uh, this is another Sam Hankey thing. Trust the process. Yep. The, um, uh, that was the, the I guess the, the, the point I was making there, though, is um, like because you guys do such, so much preparation and like it's now your, your life's work, it, like it's just so much. It's, it's going to be so hard not to add value to the people in your life, whether it's like friends that never show up on a podcast or friends that like you don't have a business relationship with. It's like, and it, like you're just going to add value because what you do is so rare. Like I, Naval Ravikant has this, uh, he's influenced my thinking a lot too. And he has this thing in, um, in the Naval, the Almanac Naval by our friend Eric Jorgensen. Yep. And he's just like, if you read an hour a day, that puts you in the 0.0001% of humans. And I'm like, right. that can't be true. Oh, yeah. No, that, that's the dirty secret of acquired and founders is that people don't read books. So if you just read them and then tell people what's in the books, you're going to 100x the market for books. And I couldn't believe that. I was having dinner <laughs> with the same friend uh, that was telling me, like I told him, I was like, oh, I'll try to build a business around like uh, my reading. This is like a couple months ago. And he's like, you vastly overestimate how much people read. He goes, how much do you, how many books a year do you think the average person reads? I was like, I don't know, 12? It's, one. it's like 0.5. It's zero. I remember, I remember asking yeah. a book publisher, he, go, and he said, America reads a book a year. They, well, he, well, he quoted some other study. I, I said 12. He's like, no, <laughs> yeah, no, not 12. He's like, it's zero. They average is zero. Yeah. Huh. It's crazy. And yeah, to your point, um, I've become friends with a bunch of uh, writers. Some of them I met through the podcast. And they've been telling me, like teaching me about the publishing industry and just breaking down like 98% of books ever published sell less than 5,000 copies. It's yeah. power law, the, the, everything. The book, the book business yeah. is the venture business, it, which is so interesting to me how uh, the advance model works. It's like quite similar to a seed financing. I mean, they, they put out, you know, $50,000 for an advance on your book, which is, you know, covers yep. your cost of living while you're writing it. And like, they kind of don't care about recouping it because no, the, they, it's the, even worse. The whole business is about do I did I sign up, you know, um, James Clear this year? Yeah, and like you know when you have Michelle Obama on your hands and you have to pay for it, but you don't know when you have a James Clear on your hands. Yeah, and when that becomes the book that America reads this year, you better make sure it's in your publishing house and not one of the other three big or four big whatever it is publishing houses. Seed funding is better because their advances are recoupable. Right. So it's like, this, I was having this long conversation. Yeah, it's I, the we most were, preferred stock. We, yeah, we were we were talking before. It's, par it's participating preferred. We were talking before we started recording. I was like, man, Jimmy Sony would be great to do a sessions with just because he's got this historical knowledge of PayPal, PayPal being so important yep. to like Silicon Valley history. And he, we were talking about this and he's like, no, like I have to pay that back through sales. I'm like, oh, because yeah. the thing is, um, going back to like, um, did you guys listen to Gamecraft, Blake Robbins? Oh yeah, so every episode. Yep. So excellent. Like so good. unbelievably good. And what I loved about it is how they focused on the business model innovations and how one decision by some yep. random group of programmers in the 1980s affected a business model decision 10 years later or whatever. Yep. And I, I was talking to Jimmy about this. I go, 
the books are fantastic. They, they're the best products in the world. You can, uh, there's a great quote in Poor Charlie's Almanac, which says that uh, there's ideas worth billions in a $30 history book. For Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett, that is literally true, right? Yep. yep. Um, and what I don't understand is like, you guys have such a high value product and you haven't innovated on the business model at all. Yeah. And so I was telling um, Jimmy, I was like, do you know the deal? Like, like you just, you think about this as like an entrepreneur. Like you're not a writer, you're an entrepreneur and your product just happens to be a book. But you can make money off that any kind of way you want. Like you can just get creative. I go, people think it's crazy where I'm like, I'm trying to be the Jay-Z of podcasts and people are like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> and uh, I did like that. I episode, do, have you done episodes on Jay-Z? That episode I did on Jay-Z's yeah. autobiography is one of my most popular. People listen I bet. to it two, I three, listen four, to it. I love Jay-Z times. and I love you. So like, I can't believe I haven't listened to that Jay-Z episode. Jay-Z is, has the founder mentality and he had it since oh, he was a kid. 100%. And you yeah. just see everything his whole career. And people look at him like, oh, like, this is another thing about intelligence manifests itself in vastly different ways. It's not always like credentialed. In many cases, it's not, right? But yep. like Jay-Z is a straight up genius if you listen to him and, and what he did. And he looked at it, he's like, yeah. He says it from the get-go. He's like, I thought I told you characters, I'm not a rapper. He's like, I'm a businessman and rap just happens to be my product. And so I'm yep. going to think about it like that. I go, Jimmy, you should do that. I go, why don't you just find a deal like, Jim, like Jay-Z did with Samsung? He's like, what are you talking about? Well, that's like true... Founders, entrepreneurs, whatever, you know, founders in yeah. your case, the title you want to put them, they care about ownership. <laughs> like, they own their work. <laughs> and you realize that you could, the, the business model matters, which right. is why I brought up GameCraft. So what Jay-Z did, this is years ago. This is his Magna Carta, Holy Grail, probably came out in 2013. So he goes, he goes, um, you know, I could I record this 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 uh, album and then I could sell like normal. You know, stream it and then sell it for $10. You want the physical copy, et cetera, et cetera. He goes, he goes what if I just want my money guaranteed? So he goes to Samsung and says, Samsung, you're launching this new app, uh, this new phone, and you have your own app on it. Uh, I'm going to sell you, I will sell you uh, a million copies, $5 each. You give me $5 million guaranteed from an album. I'm still going to own it. So he gets mm -hmm. a streaming app yep. lights. He goes, and so what I'll do is like, you pay me $5 million. The first million people that get access to my album are going to be Samsung, they have the, whatever phone was coming out. Yeah, yeah. You download it for free if you have this device. And so it's advertising to the Samsung and it's guaranteed money to him. I go, dude. You're writing about technology founders. It was like, there's these venture capital funds that have right. $80 billion of assets under management. It's like, hey, will you pay me a million dollars to write this book? And then you say, hey, this book is now presented by whatever firm. This is why me and you, have, us three have talked about this privately. You guys already know this was like, there's been like something like 15 acquisition or investment offers for founders. I said no to every single one. A lot of them are like this, where it's like, oh, well, you have the attention of people that are valuable. Right. You just said the worst thing that can happen to a venture firm is they miss the, the hit of that. So they have to expand, like they have to make sure they catch that, right? Yep. So it's like, hey, we'll we'll pay for founders or whatever, give you X amount of money, pay you to do it. You do exactly what you do. The only difference is, essentially they're trying to buy up our inventory forever. It's like, hey, founders is presented by X company. If you're going to raise money, email here, you yep. know? Yep. And the, the response I have when these I get these pitches is like, if I did that, that means I'm not actually learning the lessons in the books. Right, right. Which is like, you never give up control. It's like, no, I, Ooh, that's why would interesting. I ever do let's, that? Let's dive into a, like a deal structure on that. So like, w what if they weren't, what if you weren't giving up control and what if you weren't giving up economics forever? You're just doing a period of time buyout of your, all your ad inventory. This is the intelligent thing. This is what Tegas is doing with Invest Like the magic, Best. Yeah. And this is why like, it's crazy to me when I talk to people and they don't understand this. So I had a conversation uh, with a founder and he's like, it's really weird. I'm not going to say who it was. He's like, it's really weird that this company is running ads on that podcast every single episode forever. And I'm like, not oh. at all. And I go, oh, see. And I, <laughs> standing, and I go, moving parade, not exactly. standing I go, I go, David Ogilvy ran the same exact <laughs> ad in the same magazine for 30 years. And it was still effective. Yeah. And so yeah. I went, I was like, this is, I go, what do you think Coca-Cola has been doing for a hundred? This is not new ideas. So Either Coca-Cola is really dumb or. <laughs> exactly, exactly, or exactly. And I don't think they're like, dumb. And I huh. talked to. Apple has the prime billboard in every major city in America to advertise whatever the latest iPhone is. In forever. A, forever. Yeah. So I talked to uh, Michael Elnick, who's the co-founder of Tegas. Tegas yeah. And he's an, you guys, well, yeah, we yeah. all know each other. Great dude. Uh, and we talked about this, like, and this is a, a, another example because this sometimes somewhat affects our business because uh, when there's like a decline in overall economics, like uh, ad markets usually shrink a little bit and ad rates come down, and it's like, oh, you're doing exactly what investors do. Yeah. Like, when what what do Charlie and Buffett do when there's a crash? They don't. They right. fucking deploy, deploy. Right. You right. read Izzy Sharp's fantastic autobiography, the, the founder of Four Seasons, right? And he says this. He goes, yeah. he's building what didn't exist at the time, the only chain of five-star hotels at the time. And he says, I grow 
and this is every founder does this, Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, Henry Kelly Frick, when they have recessions, that's when they grow. So what he yeah. would do is his, mm. his competitors would pull back on advertising, he would spend more. Yeah. And he says, he claims, I think in the book, he, he increases market share by like 25 or 28% using this over and over again, because human nature is, oh crap, uh, things are yeah. small, and they yeah. cut. This is what Ogilvy said. Ogilvy's like, if you need advertising, to sell your product, it's not a marketing expense. It's a production cost. It's a it's a it's actual uh, cost of manufacturing your product. And so what what Tegas, what Michael Elnick did that was such a fucking genius move was first of all he knew something was working right, and he scaled up through podcast ads, and um, he knew it was effective. And then he's like, oh okay, well like now you have this the all these people in the tech industry, uh, they, they, their stocks creating, everybody's like running and retreat. What does he do? He goes like, oh, uh, there's, calls, probably, there's probably available inventory. And so he goes, uh, hey, uh, Colossus Network, I'd like to buy up uh, every single ad inventory <laughs> for 2023 on every single one of your shows. That's how you know that, that likelihood that guy's going to win. Like, yeah. I don't know the details of his business. It's private and everything else. It's like, that's the right decision. The yep. same decision. That's what Ogilvy yep. would have done. That's what Buffett and Munger do when they put money in. Like, that is... That's what Coca-Cola does. It doesn't matter the economic climate. It's, you're ever going to see less Apple uh, uh, billboards. You're going to see yeah, less no. Coca-Cola. No. It's interesting to like, think about this in the um, venture business, right? Like, uh, which obviously, as we record this here in mid-March, you know, 2023, there's a lot it's, going on in the venture it's business. It's so dynamic right now right. that I feel like we don't know the last two iterations of what have happened because we've been recording and I haven't checked my phone. Like that's yeah, how fast right, the world right. is moving right Things now. Things are happening very quickly as we speak. Uh, but I think a consequence of that, to your point about like you should advertise heavier during recessions, I think different customer differentiation among venture firms is just declining rapidly, right? Like, like what is... Well, no, it was until uh, interest rates went up. But now, that no, but even like I, I think, I think, again, I think both the up and the down cycle is both. I think I are commoditized. I totally disagree with this. I think when when commod when capital was a commodity and money was free, it was extremely hard to differentiate yourself as a venture firm or any financial firm. But like, it it should be easier than ever to differentiate yourself because the thing. Okay, but how do you, okay so how do you differentiate yourself right now? You, uh, you guys are doing it. You, you can, I mean, well, one of them, like, let's let's abstract away, like, speaking to the acquired audience as as one of them, uh, or as a gigantic means of well, differentiation. Well, let's just say you're, you're XYZ average venture firm out there. Uh, having money and writing the checks. Right, but, but yes, having money, right? But, like... I, a year from now, it's like six to 12 months from now, that's going to be differentiating. Well, this is a great moment to pause and inject some data into this VC funding conversation from our good friends and sponsor of this episode, PitchBook Data. And to underscore my point and bolster my own argument against David. Oh, here we go. Ben, you're bringing our sponsors into this debate. VCs deployed almost $85 billion into private companies in Q4 of 2021 at the peak. In Q4 of 2022, just 12 months later, that had dropped from $85 billion to right around $35 billion. Oof. And just another data point, the number of funds that raised money in 2021 went from 1,270 down to 769 in 2022. And so, like, everyone already knows this, but the numbers really do help you to contextualize the market reset uh, and, obviously, the aftermath. It's so crazy that, like, what, that's a well over 50% drop in capital raise and probably just about a 50% drop in number of funds like that, yeah. being raised, something like that. But it is still like an astronomical amount of capital and number of funds relative to 10, 20 years ago. Totally. But I do want to cite a second uh, research report that PitchBook put out called What the Future Holds for Private Capital with another interesting stat. So by 2021, VC AUM, assets under management, had peaked at about $2.6 trillion. Trillion! And due to valuation declines, PitchBook currently estimates that the net asset value is now down around $2 trillion. And of course, most of you know that AUM numbers mostly consist of dollars already deployed, and the vast majority of the rest is committed dollars that have not yet actually been called in capital calls from LPs. So when people end up referring to like, oh, there's all this dry powder available, the amount of, of actual available cash is much, much smaller. And that's before even considering 
all the dynamics about whether VCs want to call that capital right now from their LPs. Totally. See, David, now you're just bolstering my argument from where we're sitting with David. Listeners, we'll link to both these pieces of research in the show notes. You can get access to the very best company data. In addition to research, they have like just a treasure trove of information on what companies raise what money, when, at what valuations, number of employees, board composition, etc. It really is the best. I mean, there is so much noise in this data out there if you search around on Google on the internet. PitchBook always has the absolute cleanest, like best data that you can trust, which is super important. Totally. They have 3.5 million companies in the data set, 500,000 investors, and over 100,000 funds. PitchBook's awesome. They did the arena show with us last year, and they're they're just great partners. So if you want to sign up for PitchBook, they are currently offering a free week trial that is coming up soon. Don't miss it. You can go to pitchbook.com slash acquired, get all the details, and just tell them you heard about them from Ben and David at Acquired. Thanks, PitchBook. Thank you. So I have a thought on this. Uh, one, I don't know anything about venture investing. Two, I don't know anything about investing, period. Like I get to talk to super smart investors and I'm sure the questions, I'm like, hold on, you had to find that for me. And I'm sure they're like, this kid's an idiot. <laughs> um, but it, when you guys were talking a little bit about like your business and like your the venture game in general, is I just think of like what, um, one of my favorite things that I heard uh, Jeff Bezos say is, you know, for years people were like, hey, when are you going to do physical retail. When are you going to do physical retail? When are you going to do physical retail? And he says something that was crazy. He's like, physical retailing is an ancient business. And I love that term. He's like, mm-hmm. it's an ancient business. So I'm not going to do it until I know, like I can, it's so hard to improve on an ancient industry. It has yeah. to be completely differentiated. You mentioned, I heard you on one of your podcasts where you're like, you went to the Amazon Go store just as like a, like pure curiosity. It's like, yeah. not like you needed something. And so you guys have probably read that story too, where it's like, at one time they were going to do like but like meat and like all this other stuff that you'd have to like talk to somebody. He's like, no, you have to redo this. This doesn't make sense. The, the key, the, the the differentiation here is that you walk in, you walk out. Not walk in, talk to some guy, you're like he's like cutting salami for you. Like <laughs> you gotta get that out of there. And so I've had this thought because I've read a bunch of biographies on investors too. And like investing is an ancient business. Yep. Like, yep. And, and we're just doing it in different ways now. And so uh, I was like, well, if you if you wanted to invest, right? Uh, let's say you wanted to invest in private companies, which people have been doing forever. Um, I always think of like, like where did J.P. Morgan get his deal flow? And you know, like you've read through the history, it's like people think, oh, he, that was J.P. Morgan Bank. Like, no, no, there's no retail bank. Like, you're not going in there. There's no ad on, like a sign on the door. It's like here's J.P. Morgan companies. Like, it was a relationship based. It's yeah, like mm-hmm. you got in if you knew somebody, right? Yep. I read this biography that's incredible. I highly recommend people people read it. Uh, it's episode 103 of Founders. It is the richest woman in America, Hetty Green. I can't remember this. The I love title. how he denies that he knows every number of every episode and then busts out three more. Oh, it's only because I, I like reference this all the time. So Hetty Green, <laughs> right? It's only because you reference every episode all the time. <laughs> <laughs> One day it's just going to be a recording of yeah, just yeah. all the episode numbers. Um, but Hetty You Green, are an algorithm. Um, you are your Readwise app. <laughs> well, that's how I get it. So um, the Hetty Green, though, was so wealthy that she bailed out the city of New York. Like that book has unbelievable stories. This what? is I've never heard this person's name and they bailed out the city of yes. New York. Her family, so the richest, when she was alive, her, the richest uh, city in the world per capita was like New Bedford, Massachusetts. Oh yeah, Whaling. Yeah, yeah. Whaling. Bingo. Yep. So her family made so much whaling and the way they looked at the family fortune is I am a steward of this money. My job is to make it grow so that the next generation has more. And then they want, she's like the third generation mm. of these whaling. And then whaling, decimate, like it, it died out, I think, the generation before her, so they had to figure out how to make money. The technology stocks of her day, railroads. Like, she yep. made a ton of money in railroads, and then mm. she'd buy land, uh, like real estate in New York and everything else. But anyways, my point being, and um, I had this conversation w- with Patrick one day. Um, I was like, think about it. Like, that was an ancient, investing is an ancient business, so like, you wouldn't do what Hedy Green did. Like, where did she get her deal for, from? Uh, people knew her, uh, they knew she was wealthy, they knew that she was the first person to go to in financial panics, they called financial panics, what we call recessions and depressions now. And it was like, you know, every three years back then. Yeah. Um, and so what she would do is she had a desk in Chemical Bank in Manhattan. So the, the advantage there is geography, physical location. You're at the center of finance in America. You need to be here. You build a reputation. So literally there's stories in the book where there'd be a line of people in financial crashes waiting for at her desk. It's like, okay, I'll sell you my railroad stocks, t- pennies on the dollar. Cornelius Vanderbilt did the same thing. She invested with him and a bunch of other people, right? And I was like, but what would you do today? 
Like you're an you're you want an edge. Everything we're talking about is like you need an edge, right? You yep. can't play. Ed Thorpe has a great the great quote in his book. He's like, I've been a man, money manager for fifty years. One thing I know is you you the surest way to get rich is only play games and make investments where you have an edge. Right. Right. Which is another way of saying do something do something your competitors don't aren't or can't. Or Edwin Land. So Edwin Land plays a huge role in my life. Founder of Polaroid, Steve Jobs Hero, because he said, uh, "I have a personal model. It may not fit anybody else. Don't do anything somebody else can do." And so I was like, oh, okay, I don't think anybody else could do founders the way I do it, so yep. I'm just going to do this, yep. right? Yep. So my point being is, like, how would you do it today? Well, um, you would. it would look very much like what I think you guys are building. And I'm not an investor, so I don't know anything about your, your world, but it's just like I'd spend my time reading and learning about business history. Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett did that. Every single investor you guys have probably read about does that all the time. They read constantly, right? Yep. Uh, I would share what I know. That's going to build my network of other people. Those people are eventually going to sell me deals. Then I have this huge advantage that you couldn't even do 10 years ago or 15 years ago because there's no such thing as a podcast, right? It's like now I can record all the stuff I'm learning, right? Which we should say, like, there have been iterations of this. Like, this is how uh, Union Square Ventures became Union Square Ventures or Foundry Group became Foundry Group. because Blogging. Yeah. You know, blogging and then Brad and Jason writing the book on venture deals. I mean, it's like... Angel, this, uh, venture Hacks with uh, Naval and yeah, Rivi. Totally. Uh, I have two other examples. It's just like, it's not even venture. Like, what is the most successful content marketing of all time? Uh, Michelin? No, Berkshire... Shareholder letters. <laughs> totally, of course. Berkshire of course. shareholder yeah, letters. Of course. Because this is how you know <laughs> he's a genius. It is the greatest act of salesmanship because you never even see the sale happening. It's like, hey, yeah. and they spend, you know, you guys have probably done this research, how much time they spend on those letters. It's yeah. like half a year, seven, eight months for every yeah. letter. This is not like, oh, I just jotted some shit down on what I learned <laughs> this year. And the crazy thing is like, he's- Old he's, Uncle Warren. <laughs> how many people have, this is something Charlie taught. Oh, so this is a great, great thing that, that uh, this came up here. Did so, you talk about the letters with him? No, I asked him about like, so I was explaining to him, I was like, Charlie, I'm literally in the middle of like reading about you when you were like around my age. So every time I read a book, I'm like, okay, I, first of all, I know what year they're, they're born. So every time as I go through the books, I'm like, how old are they? And I write down, okay, he's 24 here. He's 30. I want to know what they were doing in and around my age. And so I'm like, Charlie, I'm thinking about you guys. Like you just started, like your fun starts when he's like 41 or something like that. I don't remember what it was. Right. And, um, and I was like, then like 50, like you start out, you're trying to figure things out. You could see them kind of figuring out, making the mistakes. You guys did an excellent job on your episode, like talking about what they learned from. Getting to like get away from the Ben Graham, like get to wonder, excellence. Yep. Great businesses are yep. rare. We should be in there. And then just let time do all the work. And I was like, and now like you guys put up the greatest investment record the world's ever seen. It's like, are you surprised? He goes, of course. <laughs> He's like, of course I'm surprised. Like, how could you not be? Like, we want to be successful and we were like, had, we were ambitious and driven, but there's no way you could say, hey, I'm going to be worth, what's, right. what's Berkshire's market cap right now? I don't know. Like, um, 500, 500 billion? 500 billion. Yeah, whatever yeah. it is. But he said, um, but uh, the, the, the reason that popped to my mind um, when, like, when I was asking him, uh, like, these, these questions, let me actually get the exact note because I don't want to mess up. Um, the way he said it, because his lines were just excellent. Um, and so he goes, yeah, he's surprised how successful him and Warren turned out, but how could you not be surprised? And then he says something that was fascinating. He goes, I think we get too much credit. And I was like, whoa, that's interesting. Like, why do you think that, yeah. Charlie? And he's like, uh, it's very, he goes, it's, he, he, I find it odd to be so wealthy and loved. That's not, uh, these are not exact words. These are my interpretation of his words. Let me just be clear here. I find it so odd that to, to be wealthy and loved I, that's not a usual human yeah. reaction. And then my note tied to why I think the Berkshire letters are the greatest content marketing of all time. He goes, I, and I go, I wonder if this is because they spent so much time teaching others. Mm. So what is, when you listen to Acquired, you guys are teaching, right? Mm. Berkshire, I'm going to go to Paul Graham too. Berkshire, they're teaching. Like you could just not read a fucking book and just read Berkshire's letters and you're going to get you're a learning. fantastic yeah. education, right? Yeah. And then in there is like, oh, by the way, we'd like to be the buyers of choice. So right. if, you happen, if you happen to know of this business... Like this business that you want to get your hands on, like, you know, and you care about it and he does this excellent product differentiation, call me. Yeah. yeah. The greatest content. What are the, what is like, how much money do they make off of that? And obviously, um, and I think this is probably, I don't even know if it's on the list of things that they care about, but like, it's also marketing for their businesses. Like totally. I have Geico car insurance because it's a Berkshire Hathaway company. <laughs> this is how we talked. I'm drinking. I feel these. an extra kinship for Brooks running shoes. Absolutely. For sure. I'm wearing Brooks right now. Okay. So I, I'm wearing I, our arena shoes. There you go. I changed out. I was in a polo hoodie right before I came over. 
I watched a documentary on Ralph Lauren. I just did a podcast. On I just this. listened to your episode. Yeah, I think it's episode 288. I'm, I wonder if I'm right. There it is, there it is again. <laughs> Let's see if I'm oh, right, wait. though. Let's see if I'm right. I could be wrong. I could be full of crap. It's 288. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, but before that, I had watched a documentary on him, like, years ago, and I found out that he did the... I always go to Ben for the proper pronunciation. Like, we'll do the same podcast. I will... I say, like, Akio Morita. And then he's like, <laughs> Akio Morita. I'm like, all right. I go with Ben. I trust Ben. Oh, uh, you get the. I, I I will give you the correct American pronunciation. Of something. <laughs> and it's unclear if it's actually right or not. So but. he did the same thing that Akio did. You know, like they they were struggling in the early days of Sony. They get this huge order. Like we're gonna take a hundred thousand units or whatever it is, but take off Sony and put on our name. And Akio's like, we have no money. Yeah. I'm. But he refused to do that because like I'm not it. building yeah. your company. I'm building mine. I love that like that entrepreneurial like yeah. bullheaded tendency. Same thing with Ralph. Ralph was broke. Him and his wife are living in a house or apartment with a train running over uh, on top of them. They're sleeping on a mattress and he's making ties. And Bloomingdale's like, well, take them. We love them. Take that name off. You're going to be our house brand. Yeah. And he packs up his ties. He's like, I'm not here to build your brand. I'm here to build mine. Like that. So the... Which Hearing is funny that? because later in life, like he would make so much money on just licensing out his brand. <laughs> right. He's like, I don't right. even make any of the products. Yeah. I literally just license the brand. Hearing that made me buy more polo clothes. Hearing your affinity for Geico makes you buy Geico. The advertisers you haven't acquired because they love you, your your audience. If you, if, I know you guys vet them, and like like you have a ton of people that want to uh, advertise that you don't let. It's like your relation that goodwill that you're building up, the goodwill that that Buffett built up. Another, the second, maybe most, and, and, you, by, is, and by the way, there's a litmus test for that. It's does the acquired Brit like I want to only work with sponsors that I want to so full throatedly endorse that I feel the acquired brand gets stronger by working with them. Yeah, and like if you can actually just keep doing that durably, I think that is like an amazing way to build a brand. And you know, we try; it doesn't always work, and sometimes we just don't sell ad slots because we're like, well. We, the bar's here. It's long term. Like, okay, I miss a week on advertising. Doesn't matter. I'm doing this for you. When we get on the phone, the yeah, first time right. we ever talked, do you guys love podcasting? I love podcasting. You're going to do it forever. We're going to do it forever. We say the same <laughs> yeah, thing. Right, right, right. It's like one week, in a, in a, we could do this for another 40 years. Right. So the, 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 the same thing. It's like the same goodwill that you're talking about. It's why I'm drinking. I don't even drink energy drinks, right? <laughs> But like the format for founders, you showed up with five Jocko goes. I wanted, I wanted to give you guys. Yeah, and then you're like, I don't drink energy drinks. Right. No, but I'm starting this, to not trust this guy. This is this is uh, the only energy drink I found, and I only found it because um, the I was driving home on Thanksgiving, and all the coffee shops are closed. And I heard Jocko's podcast, and he, I know he has this, and he says he's in Wawa's, and I, I was like, wait, there's a Wawa on the Turnpike. I was like, I can just go there, and sure shit, like they're there, and I bought them, and then I was <laughs> wired for the whole drive home. I was like, oh, they work, man, this is fantastic. But the the uh, the, the point there is like, it's not like when I went to the energy drink aisle, I was like, oh, maybe I'll do Rockstar or Monsters. Like, no, they didn't no. make a podcast that right, I love. Right. Jocko I made a podcast that. I love. The you, format, you were not evaluating energy drinks at that point. The, you're... the format for our founders I got from Jocko. I found his podcast because he was on Tim Ferriss's. His podcast at the very beginning was just him reading books for an hour, hour and a half saying, oh, oh I, I like this section. That. Yeah, and he does it for um, autobiographies for military people. I was like, oh, I should do this for autobiog- for biographies of, of uh, founders and everything uh, else. So it's a combination of ideas. The second best version, and you guys know this more than me because it's your um, world and I don't know anything. I had spent three weeks reading Paul Graham's essays. Paul Graham's yeah. essays changed my life. The reason also, I, me too. Content yeah, marketing everybody. totally changed my so life. So we're going to get there. The full... Um, the, the, the reason to finally jump and dedicate my life to founders came, I was, my wife was sleeping in bed next to me. I'm up late at night. I read Paul Graham's essay, How to Do What You Love. I talk about oh, this on such um, a good one. episode 275, 76, and 77. Those are right. I know that for sure. Are the three Paul Graham episodes <laughs> I did. I talk about this snap, how he changed my, that episode changed my life, or that, uh, that essay changed my life in 275. So then I'm re, so I spent three weeks going through every single one of his uh, essays. So something his new essays lack that they had before. So you used to have this bright orange box at the top. It says, "Do you want to start a startup? Oh, apply yeah, to Y yeah. Combinator. Apply to Y Combinator." Yeah. And yeah. so I was like, "Think about." So again, it's not like you went. I, I thought about this. Like, what is the founder's version of Y Combinator? What's the acquired version of Y Combinator? Right. You have to be very careful, like who you partner with right. and what you're doing. Right. So I was like, "What is the orange box?" Right. It's not like you go to Paul yeah. Rams and he's got like. 10 banner ads for a bunch of shit. Right. He's just like, no. Yeah, he worked for you're, Yahoo. You're he knows t- that doesn't work. <laughs> Your attention is here. Yeah. And it's like, 
he didn't know that starting white comedy. You can go back and read his essays about it, watch his interviews. They had no clue. Just like Charlie told me. He's like, yep. no, I did not expect to build one of those. Well, it was called the Summer company. Founders Program. You know, yeah. it wasn't even. That's the best thing about learning about the company and founder history. It's like they didn't, there's no way when you could interview Sam Walton when he's, his shoes, the bottom of his shoes has watermelon and donkey crap. Yeah, he's not yeah. going to be like, hey guys, I'm going to be the richest man in the world. Right. Yeah. And so I love this idea of, hey, all of these discussions about the, the the business benefit all comes from, it's the byproduct of educating people, sharing people. That's why people love Charlie and Warren, why all three of us yep. love them. How much have us three learned from him, them? Right. So much. It's like, yeah. to the point where like, such a good point. He, he, I wanted to he, cry he when America I met him. Because of their content marketing. Well, like, he, I mean, it sounds straight, but like. His lessons changed my yeah. life. They're, they're going to change the trajectory of my kids' lives. Yeah. Like that is, and you know, he probably hears that a million times a day, but it doesn't matter. It's like, I got a chance to tell him that. That's it. It is crazy. Yeah, he he educated America on investing while still managing to do it better than anyone else. There were some funny things about that too, where um, he says like, you know, they get he says something like, well, you know, he, they're completely. He says, you both uh, in your episode, you talk about Snowball. Snowball has that that quote from Buffett in there. He talks about it's really important to have an inner scorecard or an outer scorecard. Inner yeah, scorecard is his yeah. dad. It's like, I'm doing this because I know it's good. Outer scorecard is like, I'm doing this. Oh, what are other people going to think about me? Newsflash. No one's thinking about you. They think about right, themselves. Yeah. So outer scorecard people cannot have, like it's almost really hard to have a, a, a happy life having an outer scorecard. I like Charlie's description of that better. He says, like, he, we, uh, I think it was Andrew that asked him the question. Maybe Chris asked him the question. It's like, were you like, were you driven to succeed, like to, to impress your dad or your mom? It's a great question. And he goes, no. He goes, I had an inner clock. And I've always had, he goes, I have an inner clock and I always had an inner clock. And I mm -hmm. did this because I wanted to do it. And like, that's, and he goes, and they're like, do you think Buffett's like that? He goes, Buffett has an inner clock too. Yep. And it's just like this idea where they did it their way, uh, regardless, they don't care what other people think. He said this about, about the fact that they keep some of their, their wholly owned businesses and like, oh, the profits are less, or they kind of just let them run out, and like, they'll just keep the cash. And then people are like, oh, you should invest the cash. And he's just like, no, because we, we're opportunists. We're individual opportunity driven is the, is the line that he has about that. Right. Uh, you were going somewhere, David, earlier with the discussion of uh, being a professional investor and how oh. it's less differentiated than it's ever been before. Well, where I was going with it was, I bet, Look at the reaction on Twitter and elsewhere, and and I think in um, you know much of the country to uh, what's happened with the Silicon Valley Bank situation. Not that this is a current events podcast, but like uh, <laughs> it's also by the time this comes out, going to be two weeks. Going to be old, old news, right? Yeah. Hopefully, things will just be calm and settle down, and there will be no more uh, impending crises. Yeah, right. But Hopefully. another one's coming eventually. Yeah, right. Like just like Charlie says, you're going to have another un right. unintended problem a year from now. Yep. I think you are right, Ben, that just having capital to invest will be differentiating going forward. However, I think the aggregate brand and reputation of the venture industry has taken a massive yeah, hit. Totally. Massive hit over the last several years. And you're not holding and, up and SVB. it just keeps like, going down. Your no, no, no. SVB is revealing to, yeah. to how other people think of Silicon Valley. What I'm, what I'm specifically referring to is VC's behavior and reactions on Twitter <laughs> yeah. over the past week. But that's just emblematic of the direction things have been going for years now. Right. Uh, like, And part of it's related to tech in general, but I think there's a specific, like, uh, maybe hatred is strong, but um, brand decline of the venture capital industry. Yeah, I agree with that. T tie it to differentiation among venture firms. So, yes, while... Uh, as the market goes down, having capital will be differentiating and like the number of participants will go down in the industry and whatnot. But how do you stand out in this market as like, like if in aggregate your industry is thought less of and people don't want to work with you, right? how do you turn that tide? Right. Yeah. If, if the next Sam Walton has the opportunity to raise venture capital dollars and he's like, you know what? I think I would rather just figure it out another way and totally. not build in that ecosystem. I think there are a lot of uh, people out there right now who want to start businesses and are like, I'm not going to raise venture capital because F that, and I don't need to. And it was right. a lie that I needed to. Right. 
Can I tell you from the founder's perspective? Because I talked to a ton of founders. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to go down, I think, hope, well, we'll see, talking to more founders than any non-VC, right? I get offers all the time like, hey, you want to invest in my company? I've said no to all of them. Um, and that, like, just because I'm just, I was like, dude, I'm focused on founders. Like, I yeah, don't care yeah, about yeah. anything right, about my right. podcast. I, and absolutely. so we have these conversations and it's just like, what VCs don't understand is like how much founders fucking hate them. Yeah, yes. They like, <laughs> yes. They hate them. And it's not they hate the good ones. They love the good ones, right? Like, I'm not going to say some of the, the brands that I've heard about, they're like, oh, no, like, we raise money from a bunch of people. They're good. They don't mess with us. But if we ask a question or we need something, they jump on it, you know? And the problem is, this is not like, it's, it's a natural, like, distribution of any industry. Like, yeah. there's going to be crappy founders and great founders. There's going to be crappy investors and great investors. And so I really think it ties back to the, the, the principle that Buffett and Munger built their business on is, is like only associating themselves with the best people on the best companies. Mm -hmm. And that solves so much other problems. So right. yeah, the, my issue is like, there's a lot of VCs in my audience too, and they're nice people, don't get me wrong, right? Um, some of them I've talked to, is just like, who gave you money to invest? Like, what is going on here? <laughs> but what I don't like is like, uh, the, the best ones, um, like this is what I like about Patrick, right? If you talk to the people that Patrick has invested in, he doesn't like, Here's a list of 10 things I took two minutes to think about. He's asking questions. He does exactly what he does on his show. Right. He asks questions. Yep. And if yep. you need something, like, I'll do whatever I can because he's got a good network and help yep. him out. But he's certainly yep. not. He's like, if I have to tell the founder what to do, then I, why did I invest in it? Like, that doesn't make any sense. So what happens is, like, I'll get these emails. Like, I love your show, et cetera, et cetera. Here's, like, 10 ideas for you. And it's just like, you read, you read <laughs> right, right, them. Right. It's like, you hired, like, an assistant or a researcher. Or maybe you wrote this yourself. You thought about this for 30 minutes. Right. Like, I think about all, this all day, every day. I've thought about this every day for years, man. Yeah. Like, that's not helpful. Like, what are you yeah. doing? Like, yeah. you're just making, I have a lower opinion of you because like, this is a fucking dumb idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the only way to, about that is like, do you know who Bryce Roberts is? Of, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he has, this is, again, I've never raised venture capital. I've never made a venture capital investment, but I talked to a ton of founders and he has the greatest description. He's like, what is the product that founders are buying from VCs? It's not money. Because everybody's got money. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a, like... Well, it used to have money. Or, yeah, I guess right. you should, But still, like, there's... the VC, in aggregate, though, like, there's still a lot of people... There's still going to be investments made in C Compared uh, to venture in the 70s, yes. Yeah. He said two words. Improved odds. That is the best, from a founder's perspective, that is the best description. It's like, if I take investment from you, as opposed to this other guy over yep. here, this other girl over there, like, who is going to be... Founders don't give a fuck about the investors. All they care about is... Will my, can you help my company succeed? Is it more likely that my company succeeds? I'm dedicating my life to this, man. This is yeah. not a fucking game. Like, yeah. can you make my company succeed? And sometimes you can do the money, sometimes you can network. There's other people sitting right across from me that could probably help with distribution, that is actually value-add. Like, that is the difference. Like, if I was gonna be a venture capitalist, and God knows I would not, not be, <laughs> right? I would just start a podcast <laughs> and then I would do it for, <laughs> and I would do it for six years and I would get really valuable and then my inbox is full of people. I don't have deal flow. This is it what comes Patrick is in, done. Yeah, it comes inbound. I have a friend, Chris, uh, Chris Powers. He uh, he's, he he um, syndicates uh, real estate investment. You know, rich people like to invest in real estate. Yep. There's all these tax benefits, and he's got. He says, David, even with like and this guy's done like I think he, he's got either a billion or two billion dollars of uh, industrial class real estate under management right now, and he's like, even he's like, David, I just was interviewing and doing my podcast. Again, same thing, educational, interviewing people operating in the real estate industry and, and, and uh, interviewing founders and just doing because he liked to do it. He wanted to talk to the yeah. sort of people, happened to press record, put it out there, never really promoted it. You know, got, uh, he's like, even with my small audience, he goes, I've raised, he goes, it go, it changes the dynamic from, hey, I'm Chris, I'm setting an outbound. Hey, I'm Chris. This is what I do. This is like, can we talk? Can we set up a meeting to, oh, Chris, love your podcast. How can I get 5 million in your front? Mm -hmm. Yep, it reverses mm -hmm. it because yep, yep. you know, like, oh, totally. They get to know you as a person. This is what I don't like. Also, and it I, shortcuts I, the relationship. But it, you just said it's a relationship, right? Which I think there's too much of this like calendar, like Tetris shit that yep. that no offense that venture capitalists play because they try to do it with me. Where our founders do this too, where they're like, hey, love your show, love to get to talk to you. Uh, can we talk? And I reply back, yeah, let's set something up. Then I get like. Uh, then they're like, I'm like routed to their fucking assistant. And then it's like, <laughs> oh, you know. Uh, How about six weeks from now Mr. on, you know, Mr. Thursday. Yeah. You know, Joe Smo has 30 minutes three weeks from now. And I've done this like once or twice. And now my response is, that's no way to build a relationship. Here's my phone number. Just text or call me when, when you're free. I'm not a 30-minute block in your calendar. And, if, I, dude, we have the inbound that all three get 
It's like, I, I'm already almost hitting a limit to how many deep relationships I can build. So I'd rather, instead of talking to a million people, I'm not a fucking investor. Uh, instead of talking to a million people for 15 minutes, I'd rather talk to five or 10 people over and over and over and over again. Yeah, That's totally, what Charlie, yeah. just, Charlie. You and I talked a lot about this and like you've rubbed off on me a lot on this. Like I have changed my, my mindset and my daily behavior hugely because of our conversations. Charlie and Warren. This is like they yeah. build relationships. They found people they like, admired, and trust. They repeat like, admire, and trust over and over again in the letters and their talks. And then they just did business with them forever. Yep. It's not this sh wide but shallow. And that's where you get the bad behavior. And anybody that's high quality can see through it and it's not going to work yeah. with you. And you're only going to succeed, like you guys, if your business is power law, you're only going to succeed if you get the very best ones. It's interesting though, like the, man, just like so much in life, like Warren and Charlie really, like they're just so often right. And if you think about like, if, if you buy the premise that the aggregate opinion of the venture capital industry has declined it's a lot and worse. Will, yeah. may continue to decline. Whether it does or doesn't, it's meaningfully worse than it used to be. What, what have Warren and Charlie done? And to your point about the best content marketing ever, what is what they do? It's a combination of a hedge fund and a private equity firm. What is the aggregate opinion, public opinion right? of hedge funds, it's managers, amazing. and private equity firms over the last 50 years? Nothing but down. What is the aggregate opinion of Berkshire? Nothing but up. You know, It's amazing. I, this is one advantage that I have, the fact that I'm not an investor, so I don't have to keep up on like, to some degree, venture capitalists have to like know what's going on, right? Yeah. And I close myself off. Like yeah. I was having dinner with Sam and his wife and they were asking me, like his wife was asking me like, hey, do you know about this person? Oh uh, no, do you know about this? I, like, and Sam's like, he's got a very limited like, <laughs> he's like, he said nice way, he's like, you can ask him about like books and shit, but this dude's not watching TV, he's not doing any other stuff, right? We keep him in a, you know, hut out back. <laughs> um, and the, and the good thing about that, though, is somebody actually, um, so essentially the way I use like Twitter or any social media is like I put out little uh, snippets from my podcast. Yeah, you you text, put out a lot on Twitter. In text, though, for him, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, Which and has been really working for you. I was, I'm going to read something that has a million, over a million views in 24 hours. Wow. Because everything's going on and because I just had dinner with Charlie. Yeah. So I'm going to read this and then I'll go back to what This is the, an amazing tweet, by the way. So uh, I go, Charlie Munger tells a story about human nature. Now, I didn't put this because of the bank run or any of this other shit. Like I was just thinking, I was like, oh, this is, I was reading Wait, my highlights. Wait, you didn't post this uh, it, like with regards to the bank run? No, no. I remember I reread my highlights every day. Yeah. And so when I reread my highlights, what my Twitter is, is like when I reread highlights, like, oh, that's a good one. I just put it on Twitter. Oh my God. That yeah. you have like just the greatest timing in history. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, like it wasn't right. intentionally, I knew it was going on, but it never said, oh, let me, I need an SVB tweet. I don't give a fuck about current right. affairs. Right. Like I don't have right. any money in SVB. Like. Whatever. So it goes, Charlie Munger tells a story about human nature. And then this is all Charlie speaking. One of my favorite stories is about the little boy in Texas. The teacher asked the class, if there are nine sheep in a pen and one jumps out, how many are left? And everybody got the answer right, meaning eight, right? Except this little boy who said, none of them are left. And the teacher said, you don't understand arithmetic. And the little boy said, no, teacher, you don't understand sheep. And so, <laughs> so effing good. How, okay, how, when you were in the room with Charlie for several hours, how did, like, in natural conversation, are they just pulling out these, like, parables and these fables? Like, you know. Let me, I'm going to answer that question. The best response to this tweet, I didn't even, I missed it myself. He goes, was the child Charlie himself? And I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, that's exactly what he would have done. He, he would have been the kid. Yeah, totally. He would, he would have, have been, been the kid. kid. So the reason I think it's so powerful, like the storytelling ability you guys have, how I try to break down things to aphorisms, you ask like, why is this guy on my phone, right? I only think in stories, I think people only learn through stories and then one-liners, right? That's why, Char why is Charlie, David Ogilvy, that idea, it's like, he says it in a creative way. Yep. And then you remember Fur. Charlie Munger says, hey, if you don't learn probability, you're going to go through life with a, as a one-legged one -legged man in an ass-kicking contest. So good. So, <laughs> so you good. laugh, and then you think about it. And it's I like, know. oh, what is that? Oh, it's like, so I'm going to get my ass kicked. Like, so that's the way. Um, th this is here because it's Ernest Shackleton. His family motto was buy endurance, we conquer. So we're in the podcast business. Uh, you know, people are like, you can't do podcasts. There's like 2 million of them. It's like, dude, there's like 70 or 80% of them that have quit. Right, eight and, percent in the business three, podcast three right now. Less. Me and Patrick were just talking about this. I just saw him in person in Miami, and we were talking, and I showed him this. It's like, dude, uh, for podcasts like me and Patrick's and yours, uh, yeah, business categorized in business, uh, have at least ten episodes, and I think release at least once a week. You guys, I think, are release schedules less than that, right? Two weeks, two, every two or okay. three. Uh, so those three categories is like, but in terms of minutes of content per week, we're we're the same as everybody yeah, yeah. else. <laughs> but like that was one thing. Like they release once a week, right? 
um, 18,000. And the business category is the second most popular podcast, like the second most populated Ooh, podcast okay. category. Behind. And I go, Do you know the first? Spirituality or yeah, something like faith. that. Yeah, faith. Yeah. Oh, true crime has fallen off then. Uh, yeah. No, Thankfully. So Thankfully. this is, I'm going to start. So there's a thing about that where I heard somebody said they're like, Founders is like church for entrepreneurs. And I might start dropping podcasts on Sunday. And <laughs> no, no, I'm not kidding. And if, if I do video, I, I swear to God, I went and looked. I looked at pulpits. I was like, I'm not no, going to get a fucking, on. I swear to God. I swear to God. You went like, crucifix shopping. I, I, I'm not going to get a desk. Like think about, I, I, my mom was like fundamentalist Christian and stuff. And like, I had to go to church my whole life. And it's just like, this is pretty crazy. Like, the, the, like uh, not in a bad way. I don't, I don't mean that the majority. I was like, they're learning from the same book every week over and over again. Yeah. And the stories yeah. you can tell yeah. are limitless. It's yeah. one fucking book. I can do the same thing. I have access to all the books in the world. Like I can do that. So I do think there's an element the, of- Totally. Five um, years from now, people are gonna be like, this is the moment where David started the cult. <laughs> 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 it's right here on video. <laughs> <laughs> We're cult, documenting it. Cults are the best businesses though. A hundred percent. If you listen to my episode, In and Out, episode 244. Oh yeah. There's no way I got that right, by the way. Um, <laughs> oh, now we got it. No. I did that. Um, you, you keep talking. I'll look up if you got this right. I did that episode because um, <laughs> it's 244. Of course it is. <laughs> is it? Yes. Oh, my yes. God. <laughs> I read that book because the best businesses in the world are cults. That's what Trader, the founder of Trader Joe's, yep. he wrote his autobiography. He said that Trader Joe's was a cult for the and, overeducated and underpaid. Right. And Apple. it's not to say that like like cults are amazing businesses. That's not what you're saying. You're saying the the very best businesses are cheerful. Develop a cult. In and out, yeah. in and out calls them. They they use this terminology in their business. Cheerful cult. Hmm. Cheer, it's a, a positive cult. I'm not talking yeah. about Jonestown. Let's get together and freaking drink mass suicide. No, no. Right. I'm talking things that hopefully you're building a product that's good for the world. Oh, right? We had Gary Tan on back in the day, and he was talking about Palantir at the very beginning, and he was like, "Oh, Palantir was a cult. That's why it worked." Hmm. Well, this idea also influenced me. It's, it's zero to one. Peter Thiel's book is like. You know, he says that he's like the best businesses, like or the startups, look like cults. Like yeah, you, know, you, you have yeah. to, you have to inspire emotion in people. Otherwise, it like you just you can't stand out in the world, and you, you certainly can't have repeat behavior and uh, in a sea of choices for someone to keep choosing you over and over and over again. It's just but, like it's it's like how founders it, have to be weird. This like, is one of the big things interesting that, was created by ordinary people. But I have to be intentional about this. I'm glad you said, oh, this is where we get in on camera and on recording that David is started as cults. It's like. Podcast? No, I, I go crazy. Like people start talking about me. I a bunch of them say David's too obsessed with podcasts, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm glad they say that because like even now, there's, you're like, thank you, that's a compliment. No, it's like I see an opportunity that other people yeah. don't, which is the same thing in in the book. So I think podcasts in general are just fun to make, and, and I'm obsessed with it. But they're also going to be wonderful businesses because they're prone to be cheerful cults. And how do you know that you have a cult? You just Google and see if the people have tattooed themselves with the brand. How many fucking people are walking around with a Joe Rogan's face on his tattoo? Or a Joe Rogan face tattoo on their skin? A ton of them. Right? Really? Yes. Uh, how many wow. people have tattoos of the Apple Apple a logo? Lot. A ton there's, of there's them. There's an insane number with uh, Mario. We learned this in the Nintendo Mario, research. Mario, Tesla, in and out There's a ton of... Dude, I like... Cheeseburgers are my favorite meal. I'm not tattooing a fucking in and out logo <laughs> on my arm, dude. You take another level. Yeah. And you see this over and over yeah. and over again. And so when I analyze businesses, I, I'm not just doing this. Like, it's not a game to me. I was like, oh, can I use these ideas in building my business? Mm. And like Warren Buffett says the greatest thing, and this is, I think speaks to why you guys are so like, hey, we know how big our audience is and we're going to take this seriously. Seriously, Warren goes, a, a brand is a promise. That's the best description yes. of a brand. Yeah. It's just Absolutely. like- I talked about the fact that I, I stayed in a uh, this hotel brand. I'm not going to say who it is. In Austin, I loved it. I stayed in Santa Monica. I loved it. I found out they had one in San Francisco. Oh, yeah. I didn't check the reviews. You came here and they broke their promise. I told you to stay yes. with us. <laughs> yes. And that's the biggest thing. A brand was a promise. I love. I know this is going to be excellent. The hotel's fine. It is in like, it's in the Tenderloin. It's like, yeah. a, not, like not a place you want to stay. No, I like if I wasn't traveling alone, there's no way I'd let my wife. This is the major misconception mm, about San Francisco. Every, mm. Many people who don't live here think that it's, you know, an absolute hellhole and wasteland. A specific part of it is. Yeah. But like 
There are other and, and, and unfortunately, that part COVID. is mostly where the hotels are. <laughs> yeah, uh, which is not good for the city. Because no, I'm like, it's I don't, I'm not ever staying. I'm staying with you, or I'd stay in, uh, like, I'd stay out in Silicon Valley. Like, yeah. I've stayed at the Rosewood, which is really nice. Yeah, uh, but yeah that, that <laughs> oh, is, well, that yeah. is not like the tenderloin. The most expensive hotel, which is like I didn't, good. <laughs> I didn't pay for it, so <laughs> yeah. no one ever does. I didn't, I That's didn't, the whole business model. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how much it was. It was really nice, though. Thank. I got to thank that person. Yeah, so, like, I, again, I don't mean it in, like, a, but I am very intentional. Of like, hey, I'm not going to break my promise. I'm, I want you to know, and you guys do the same thing. It's like, if I press play on an Acquired episode, there's no fucking way. This is why, I like, um, Dan Carlin is, you know, I read one book an episode. He reads, like, 30. Yeah. He only does two a year or one yeah. in a, like, <laughs> one a year. Maybe one a year. Right? But, like, I know there's no way I'm going to press it's play. It's going to be good. And yeah. he's, he didn't do the work necessary. Yeah. That's, I, what, that's what we feel. We all feel. I mean, you, yeah. In our own ways, we all definitely feel that about what we're doing. Can I get some feedback? Like, how how can we make Acquired better? Or have you ever had moments where you, like, paused an episode and were like, oh, I want to, like, talk to Ben and David about this right now because, like, I have some feedback? No. You'd probably just text us if you did. That's no, true. but, like, I, I text, I would, first of all... Um, or the model, not just not necessarily just the content, but, like... No, what you guys said on your Benchmark Dinner episode, I think, was, like, you know... Uh, there's a few podcasters. I was having this conversation with Sam yesterday. It's like there's a few podcasters that like they know what they're doing, and you they know by like what their position in the market is, like how they're thinking about it. And I'm not gonna say who, but like you guys hit it. Like what makes you special? It's the Edwin Land thing. Don't do anything somebody else can do, right? Where you said it's like your marquee thing is these super in depth. Like Blake made the funny. Um, Blake Robbins said the funny thing on Twitter I saw. I loved it. He's like, only a choir could say, all right, let's bring this home. And so an hour and a half left. Yeah. <laughs> That's your brand. People know totally. it. Totally. Yeah. And I think what you're doing here with like the sessions is like a way to also, it's like, there's no, you can't increase your, the amount of episodes that you can do because they take so much work to do. But you also have a way to surface all this information that you guys have that's valuable to other people in different formats. We were, we were talking about this uh, a little bit before, which I hate saying we were talking about this before we were recording. Yeah. So why didn't we just record? But um, you, you were also thinking about potentially doing something similar. Yeah. And there's like... Not now. For, like not years now. from now. But yeah. yeah. But for the core episodes, we spend you know, so much time preparing. But then for stuff like this, we don't prepare at all because our whole career Your is show, preparing. Does, does this yeah. make sense? Like, what what is the right number and format of sessions? Because this is the second session. Like, we're still figuring sessions out. Like, in, in your dream world as an acquired listener, what do sessions look like? Just re- I mean, your sessions should be replace your interviews. Anything that's a non-acquired, like, long deep dive, just make them a session. There's enough people interviewing fucking founders and investors. Right, right, right. But we need more conversations. So if I ever did, people are like, if you ever do an interview show, I was like, first of all, I wouldn't do an interview show. Because like, you interview is a skill. It looks easy. Yeah, like I always tell, totally. pa- I tell Patrick, oh, Patrick, you're world class at this, dude. Mm-hmm, right. Like you have, you wield. You've I'm, done it tw- you've been every, on every week and now twice a week for eight, nine and years. And he's just, it's for, I like to read. He likes to ask questions. So therefore our formats match the personality, right? Yep. And so what I tell him is like, I've been on the other side of it. It's like, you can tell it's not, he doesn't have a fucking list of questions in front of him because you can tell his good question just came off of response of what, right. Like a lot of people like, um, and it's fine, but like the Tyler Cowen thing where he just like, he has his questions and you just said something interesting, he's not going to follow up and he's going to go on the next question. It, it feels very odd because you're like, are you guys not having a conversation? Like, no, they're, they, not. they're, they're not. There's, yeah. That guy like left you an opening and how did you not take that opening? They're not. So, but Tyler, you have to do, let's tie this to Jay-Z and J. Cole and to answer your question also about like, I'm glad you guys are so much nicer where you're like, do you have any feedback? Because like, I, I can't stand feedback. We're like not in the sense of <laughs> like like I told you I texted you guys this one time. We're like uh, one guy it was fucking hilarious. The guy was like, hey, um, I don't like that you reference the, the, like the superpower of the show is that I tie. It's not like the, the episode on Ralph Lauren is going to tell you how Ralph thinks like Andrew Carnegie and Rockefeller and Bezos and it's like you literally and, know all your episode numbers by heart. And like so, I, it, to me, it's just one large conversation on the yep. history of, uh, on history of great entrepreneurs. That's that's how it is to me. It just happens to be separated. And so this, I text you this, and this guy's like, um, "Could you save that for at the end and just do it like a carve out like acquired?" And I was like, "Go <laughs> fucking listen to go listen to acquired." Yeah. No, I'm not going to go listen to those shits. <laughs> no, no, that, like, no, I wasn't in a derogatory. No, I You're like, I, I, I have a singular vision for how this is going to go, and that's why I own and control and operate the entire it's, thing. D- it's even further than that. It's like I'm not putting on a show. 
Like, there's a lot, I loved Anthony Bourdain when he was alive, I read his books, he had a huge influence on me, like, anytime I traveled to a place that he went to, I'd go and watch Have you watch done it. an episode on yeah, him? 219. Yeah, 219. There's no way that's right. There's no way. There's Keep no, going. There's no way that's right. Fact checkers. Uh, oral, on. it's called uh, the oral biography. It's, ex that format should be done more, where his assistant um, had interviewed, his assistant and a friend had interviewed a bunch of people who actually knew Tony and were there in his last days. And then she oh. used that, organized that interview into... Uh, this biography called uh, Bourdain, the definitive oral biography, I think. Um, and is it 219? It's 219. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and so, like, where was I going with that? that? I went on a digression. But, oh, so there's a line in the book I love. It says the, sh the line between Tony and the show was non-existent. Yeah. Right? That's why people, yeah. like, I hear a lot of people talk about podcasting. It's like, oh, you don't actually know what the superpower of podcasting is, right? Where it's like, to me, podcast, one of the superpowers of podcasting is it, it's authenticity scaled. Right. If yes. when I meet with founders that listen to founders and we have a three hour dinner, they all they all say the same thing. They're like, this is like a three hour episode of founders. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like the same person there. Right. Well, and I think that that is a thing that that you did really well and we sort of accidentally did well. But I realized over time uh, why that makes both of the things we've built as durable as they are. A lot of people play characters on the Internet and. Which in other mediums plays is, really well. is uh, an easy trap to fall into. Uh, and like, it's a way to catapult growth. If you yeah. adopt a polarizing character, you can get a bunch of followers. I yeah. mean, there's, there's, like a, there's a lot of dividends that pay to it. But it's exhausting to maintain over time. And it has a conflict where when people meet you in real life, they're like, oh, weird. And, and so like when you actually are just yourself, it's going to probably grow more slowly because I'm not like as polarizing. Like it would be horrifying to live as a, a, a polarizing character that you play on the internet in real life also. And so you have this more like slow organic yeah. growth path. Um, but like it is, there is this cool byproduct now where like I sit down with someone and they're like, yep, exactly the same as I expected. This is why I said have Blake Robbins on here because he gave me the dynamic, that spectrum that he talks about. Blake is a super smart person in general, but he's like, the way you think about this is there's a spectrum. This is not my idea. This is Blake's spectrum. He goes on one end of the spectrum. It's like how much do time do people spend with you, right? He's like on one end of the spectrum, you have these like 30 second TikTokers that dance, right? And then on the, all the way on the other end of the spectrum, as you move down, they spend more time with you. All the way to the end of the spectrum, you have the Twitch streamers, right? Which he helped incubate right, um, right. 100 Thieves, 40 yep, Thieves, yep. 100 Thieves, where they're spending like 40 hours or 50 hours a week with you, right? right. He goes, David, you're like one, you're not, they don't spend 40 hours with you, but you're one, one click one click to the left. Yeah. And they're going to wind up spending 10, 20, 100, 200 hours with you. And you keep moving down and like, let's say you do 10 minute YouTube videos, you know? And it's like the deeper you go down there, it's why when I think the guy's name is Nate Shot, when like 100 Thieves has a new product and he announces it, you'll see a line down the block because yep. hundreds of thousands of people have spent all their time with them. And so it's like, oh, Nate Shot has something, so I'll come down here. And you see this over and over again. And then Blake says you could have uh, like a TikTok that has a TikToker that has like 10 million followers, yet they can't even get 3,000 people to show up somewhere. Right. Um, and so I think that is like the well, way to think about it. So that's algorithmic throttling too. TikTok, it is almost a zero signal if somebody follows you. It's, it's all like, views. It doesn't, matter it doesn't not, actually yeah. matter. Or YouTube. It's like, oh, they subscribe to your channel. Like maybe that'll come up in one of the top eight videos that shows up at the top of the screen of like what they should watch next, yep. but like maybe not. So my point in all that is if they're spending a lot of time with you, and I love, this is my flip of what Charlie Munger says, that you need to learn the big ideas in the main domains, like physics, psychology, because they carry the most freight. Yeah. I flip that to time carries the most weight. As long as what we're doing, we, you said we're not playing characters, we are passionately interested in this, we're not going to quit, then we do this over a long period of time. We'll get, you'll get what you deserve. You'll get the audience you deserve. You'll get the business yeah. opportunities and everything else. It's like time carries the most weight. I know I'm not going to quit. You're going to have to pry the microphone from my cold dead hand. And I'll, I'm just going to let the chips fall where they are. And that doesn't mean I'm like lollygagging here. Like I'm on it seven days a week. I'm, I'm going to try to put, work myself in a position. So it's something I learned from, um, from um, Steve Jobs when he came back to Apple, right? And he's like, people hear that, that, that speech he gives, which he's fantastic. He's like wearing shorts. And he's like, and it's like, I don't even know if he's in the polo, the, the turtleneck yet, but he mentions like what they're going to do. And everybody focuses on the fact that he's like, we're going to, you know, there's no sex in the products anymore. And we're going to do the four quadrant thing. A lot of people in the technology industry 
particularly know that speech and like, yeah, let's let's cut the fat and like put all of our A players, fire the B and C players, put all of our A players in these four products that we're going to make, right? right? Mobile but they miss d- desktop, laptop, high end. Yep, consumer low. and pro for yeah. both laptop and desktop. Those are four categories, right? They miss what he said earlier when he talks about Nike. He's just like marketing. He's like, Apple sucks at marketing. We have to be a great marketing company. And so he said something where I read the quote and then my reinterpretation of this, right? And people don't know that. It's in Ken's, uh, no, it's in this book called Insanely Simple. Uh, I think that guy's name is Ken Siegel. And he's like, he was an ad guy at a company for Apple. And he's like, TWBA Chai at Day. It was the ad agency. So he goes and every Wednesday, uh, Actions express priority. So there's another maxim, right? He's like, I don't care what people say. I care like what they do. So when people ask me, like first people that you talk to the founders, like, hey, like, what would you do about this? I never answer. like, well, David Senra would do this. I'd say, hey, well, Charlie Munger would tell you to do this or Steve Jobs would do this mm. or like, hey, I heard a story about here. Because like my opinion is useless. It's you know my opinion on business building on how I build my business. It doesn't matter what I say. It's like, what is he, how is he approaching founders? Like, why is he making decisions? That's the important part, right? And so Steve told you, told you that marketing was important to his actions because every Wednesday at like three o'clock or I forgot the time, they had like a three hour meeting. He would approve, have to approve every single piece of advertising and marketing that went out for Apple. There's not a fucking billboard in Kentucky that went out without him saying, yes, it's going to go out, right? And so in that speech, when you're, if you actually listen to what he's saying, he's like, listen, I feel that the products we're making at Apple make people's lives better. I want, he says this line, he goes, I want everybody in the world to own an Apple device. We know that that's not going to happen because it's so expensive. But he goes, and to do that, we have to get really good at marketing. So my interpretation of that on the podcast, what I said is like, if you feel your product can improve people's lives, I think you guys already know because you get thousands of messages just like I do, that yes, listening to Acquire, listening to Founders will improve people's lives and work, right? Then you have a moral obligation to get good at marketing. Well, that all that means is not get good at marketing so our ad rates are going to go up or that we can be celebrities or any of that other shit. It's no. So these this these messages for all these of history's greatest entrepreneurs that are dead, that they don't those ideas don't die with them, and then therefore acquired founders can gather these ideas and push them down the generations. So that's why I mean it's just like I'm not dilly dallying. Yes, I'm going to let time carry all the weight, but I'm going to do everything I can so more people at least know. And if you try founders, say, oh, this sucks or whatever, whatever, I'm cool with that. But I just want you to have the opportunity to know it exists. And me and you have had these, us three have had these conversations where it's like, guys, I'm telling you right now, I've said this to you, there's millions of people that would benefit from listening to Acquired, they just don't know it exists yet. So we gotta come up and find ways to make sure that people know it exists because they will love it and it will make their lives better. Amen. I think there's also... This may be an area, I'm curious to what you what you think about this, uh, where our shows and approaches are a little different. I'm also curious what you've been thinking about this. A lot of these stories are just incredible stories, too, that are just, like, worth, I think, worth telling just for the sake of the story. Yeah, the, it's, it's, it's interesting how sometimes I'm like, I'm not sure that we came up with a lesson that I would advise a founder to follow, but I know this was very entertaining and as true as we possibly can make it. Yeah. And so, th- th- like, I, no, I think, every single episode I've listened to, there's lessons in there. That I've oh, yeah, no, yeah no, like, I'm not saying there's not lessons. Of course there are. But, like, sometimes we'll do an episode, like, I always feel this way about the most recent episode, but we, we just finished making the Nintendo episode. I'm just like, you cannot, like, if you put the best fiction writers in the world that's true. together. That's yeah. true. Yeah. And you said, come up with the best, like, corporate-ish story that you could imagine. You couldn't write something the, this good. I guess the thing I'm ref- I was referring to is a little bit the um, survivorship bias where, like, someone did something that uh, I would not recommend anyone do and it still worked. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> but it made for a great story. It's like yeah. Morris yeah. Chang and TSMC. It's like yeah. he invented the notion of a fabulous semiconductor company Mm -hmm. before there was any demand for that. And then it turned out that his timing was exactly right that like within a couple of years, a whole ton of, you know, fabulous companies spun up and wanted to use his foundry. Uh, But like he created a solution in search of a problem and like no founder should do that. Mm -hmm. But my God, did he pull a rabbit out of a hat? And so there's a good number of acquired episodes where I'm like, we should be crisper. I think about pointing out where like, I don't, this was inadvisable, but amazing that it worked. I think that goes back to the game tape analysis where we talked about Kobe Bryant. Um, Jordan did this too, where it's like, uh, I read this like 600 page biography of Kobe and in the biography, 
they interview his high school girlfriend. <laughs> and they're like, what was it like to date Kobe Bryant in high school? She I'm goes, surprised he had a girlfriend in high school, right? <laughs> like, well, not for very long. Yeah, nah. It's like, uh, it's like, what's it like to date Kobe Bryant in high school? She's like, well, our dates consisted of me going to his house and watching tapes of Michael Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson. <laughs> it's just like, That's we're not leaving. I'm not taking you out to dinner. Like, yeah, yeah. we're literally going to watch this thing. And so I think the, the, the game tape analysis of that is just like, it is helpful to realize that a lot of this stuff, it's impossible to plan in advance. It's the, the one of the great, I mean, Steve Jobs has a ton of great quotes. Oh, the, one of the, the best Stanford ones is like, speech. he's like, the, yeah. the commencement is like, connect the dots it's impossible. Backwards. You're only going to connect the dots looking backwards. So you have to put something, faith in something. You can call it karma, religion, God, intuition, but you have to do something. I just did a reread Ray Kroc's autobiography, the guy from McDonald's again. And I, I, it hit me. Yeah. I've been thinking about the Steve Jobs quote too. And this is why it's so valuable to read. I think your past you mentioned highlights. this in yes. the in the, in the McDonald's like, episode. If you think about this, like he's a perfect illustration of what Steve uh, observed fifty years after Ray dies. For God's sake, he's just yeah. like he goes from selling paper cups. Paper cups leads him to selling multi mixers, which are like uh, make milkshakes. Right. Multi mixers goes like, why the hell are you have eight? Why does the, these McDonald brothers out in San Bernardino have eight of my machines? Like yeah. you, people, he'd had a hard time selling one. That goes to. The, the franchise system, which he didn't even do well. And then he meets Harry Somber, and then Harry Somber's like, dummy. Real estate. You don't even know what business you're in. You're not going <laughs> to, he's like, you don't build an empire off a 1.4% cut of a 15 cent hamburger. Yep. You build an empire by owning the land upon which that hamburger is cooked. Those five things. There's no, f- he's selling, he's spelled, From he's paper sold, cups to real estate. He yeah. sold paper cups for 17 years. <laughs> yeah. But he just like, hey, I have to go in my gut to the point where he you got divorced over this. His wife was like, you can't do this, Harry. And he's like, you have to trust my instincts. That's one thing. Uh, to what Ben said way back in the beginning of the conversation, that you're really good at highlighting. Ray Kroc was an asshole. Like, he was a terrible person. And he he didn't try to hide it. Yeah, Most people right. in autobiographies are trying to hide it. Yeah. He's literally like, thank you very much, uh, June Martino, uh, my first employee, uh, for missing every single one of your kids' birthdays. Uh, you're going to get some stock at McDonald's. It's going to get you rich. But 20 years later, I'm going to fire you. Yeah. And he didn't. He, you didn't have to put that story in there. He yeah. put. The, he chose to put that. That's crazy, dude. Yeah. I said on the podcast, I was like, "Listen, it's interesting. Like, I'm glad he persisted. Interesting ideas for business. But like, not only do I would never want to do business with this guy, I wouldn't even want to be his friend. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't want to do business with Steve Jobs, but I want to be his friend. You yeah. know? Oh yeah. He'd be I a would, very interesting yeah, person like, to be friends a, with. Oh, I feel like the opposite. What's that? Like, I'd want to do business with Steve because you could create incredible things together but i'm not sure you'd want to be friends i I think the difference is from like a founder's perspective like there is no working with steve jobs it's working for you hear the stories of how he even treated like his subcontractor or not like the owners of the companies that contracted it's like these guys are empire builders like they're literally building worlds they're not used to being like they're (laughs) charlie was talking about this um because you know he he loves like uh Lou, uh, Lee Lu, the new guy, the BYD guy, Du Wan, oh, yeah. I don't know his name, something. Yeah, yeah. Those guys. Um, he loves Lee Kuan Yew from Singapore. Yep. And what you realize is like, it's like these are founder types, but you can't be like founders are benevolent dictators, or in some cases, they're dictators of their own company. And like, some people call Lee Kuan Yew, you know, a dictator. It's like, oh, like, can't do that in America, even if right, that would right, be beneficial. Right. But, um, all of them. There's no working with them. They're like, they're yeah. going to be in complete control of the situation. Like, even being in the room with them. Like, they're, I'm not saying they'd be rude or mean, but like, you're a subordinate to them. Hmm. Because everything is in, Ray Kroc, everything is, he says in the book, uh, perfection is difficult. I'm demanding perfection at McDonald's. I will constantly keep expanding this empire till I die. If you get in my way, I will run you over. He's like, he says in the uh, movie, he's like, uh, if my competitor was drowning, I'd walk over and put a hose in his mouth. And he goes, <laughs> and he was uh, on the other end of the call is McDonald brothers because they're fighting over this. And he goes, would you do the same? And the state of thing is it's like, you're going to have to compete on my level or else yeah. I will literally destroy you. Yeah. What, so Warren and Charlie are so interesting. Right? I'm trying to decide if they are the complete opposite of that or if they actually are like that just in their own ways. What Every single person has some kind of like their public persona is for that level, yeah. right? It's not like a podcast where they're going to listen to Joe Rogan for 1,600 episodes. Like, you know who Joe is. You can't hide. He's doing three hour shows <laughs> three right. days a week for 15 years. You have probably right. a good idea who he is. You see flashes of like, you know, imperfection like we all have. 
I don't think he, he just you don't get to that level without having he's got sharp they all got sharp elbows like yeah, yeah. you ever heard read stories about how warren uh negotiates <laughs> it's yeah. like 1250 bid oh, what about 14 1250 bid what about 13 1250 bid because well, he's he's already so he spent 10 years analyzing your business and he knows exactly the price that he's going to buy it yeah. for and so now he's give, telling you the price he's going to buy it for yeah he's, it's, this wasn't like a new consideration that popped up and he's like oh look at this a business it's like no at the scale he's operating at like he knows all the businesses yeah and in this this is from the Jim Clayton's autobiography, um, where he buys um, Clayton Homes. Right. And he even said like he he wanted to sell to Buffett. He idolized Buffett, and he talks about like he wasn't insulting him by any means, but he's like Warren wants the microphone. And if you're in an mm. area where Warren doesn't have the microphone, he is not interested. And I've heard that about Warren a lot. Mm. You know, so it's just like yeah. they're, they're they're world builders. Like he runs yeah. everything. You think yeah. you're gonna go from being poor to having two hundred billion dollars and not distort your perception of the world? Yeah. It's impossible. I, you, say, say more about Warren wanting the microphone. What does that mean? Like it, literally in person. Like they would do, I think they were doing, Jim Clayton was at either like an event to talk to the employees or whatever the case was. Like he, like Jim wanted to have input and he's like, Warren would not allow it. Like he monopolized hmm. this. And I've heard that about Warren. Like same thing. We're like, you're going to. There's got to be an element of him that, you know, loves the shareholder meetings. Oh, of course. Like, but he didn't need to do that. He, didn't need he to created do that. an event about, around you know right. how he, he loves, loves having a million you know, people come. Yeah, you know how he loves it because he's still doing it. Right. right, right. Like he does. He doesn't have to do anything in the world that he doesn't want to do. Right, and that, that's how you know he loves it. Like they're they're beyond. I told you we talked about earlier how like just how disorienting it must be to like have. And I would love to know this feeling. Don't get me wrong. Like have a two hundred billion dollar net worth. It's like you're you're living life on like God mode. Like. Right. It's, it's it's insane. Like I, I was watching this video. I don't know if it's true, but it's like Jeff Bezos's private jet has its own private jet. Like, <laughs> so well, his, his new his yacht, yacht has, has a, a chase yacht. Yeah, yeah so it's like your yacht has right. a I yacht. I think it's like a guest yacht. Like I think it's so that I mean he is, he now owns the biggest yacht in the world, and there's a yacht that will sail behind it. I was this maybe uh, I don't know, maybe we'll become so successful someday that I will regret my words on this, but. I gotta imagine having a yacht is actually not like additive to your life. Oh, so this is a fun. Like, I think Ralph that's more Lauren problems thing. than. Yeah, uh, so I'm. I think it was Ralph Lauren uh, sold his yacht and is now a charter yacht because he was like, this thing was more work than any of the businesses I've ever run. One of the most interesting ideas I've heard, and it comes from our mutual friend Jeremy, who we I think we mentioned earlier in the podcast. Hopefully, we did give him credit. I uh, actually had was talking to him and David Perot. And I'm pretty sure Jeremy said this, not David, but um, he's like, I would actually make the argument because everybody's like, oh, like, uh, what does Charlie talk about? Call the Berkshire jet the indefensible. The indefensible, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. And then like, wasn't there a second one, the indefensible too? <laughs> the indefensible before like, they bought NetJets, and now it's like we should be on NetJets. So you look, you look at, um, you look at like those, like how could you possibly spend like you know these yachts cost twenty five thousand dollars an hour to operate in fuel or some crazy number the planes are the same like yeah, you know yeah, how expensive yeah. they are and Jeremy makes the point and Jeremy knows because he's been buying businesses forever and he's exposed to like great wealth uh, people you know unbelievable amount of wealth he goes he makes the argument that they're actually underpriced assets and I was oh, like oh tell me more wow. he's like that's that's not what so I would expect th- to hear yeah so I'm going to tell you this book that just proved his point I actually got to text him and tell him this. Um, so he's like, they, they use it not for, it's, if you're not like yachting, sitting there sunbathing, right? He's like, they're using it for like customers and uh, invest and potential. And so I had heard this, I'll tell you about how this relates to Invisible Billionaire. So I had heard this, cause again, I've never raised money. I don't pay attention to the venture industry. I don't know anything about it. I just have a bunch of founder friends and founders tell founders everything. And so I'll have these discussions where they're like, they describe the courting process that they get from some of these well-known, super famous people. And it's like, well, you, the process you just described to me sounds like an old rich dude that like wants to sleep with like a young woman. Yeah, like, what yeah, would yeah. you do, right? And there's, uh, what we, we actually didn't put it in the episode, but there's a bunch um, of this in Nintendo history uh, because Warner Brothers bought Atari. And so Warner Brothers was running Atari as Nintendo was kind of like... And this is the, how they courted uh, uh, Nolan. That's how they courted, yeah. So that's how Warner Brothers courted... Atari and Nolan, and yeah. then how they tried to court Nintendo was the private jets. The um, what was it? it? Was Clint Eastwood? They uh, put Clint Eastwood on the private jet with, with Atari Nolan, fl- Bushnell, flying yeah. coast to coast. So what does tell you? By the company, History yeah. doesn't repeat; human nature does. Yeah. These founder dudes are running uh, uh, technology companies now, and they're like, "Yeah, oh yeah, this." I'm not going to name who. They're like, "Oh yeah, he uh, gave us he he picked us up in Manhattan in his private helicopter, and we landed at his Hamptons estate." 
Do you think he got the deal? He got the deal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this guy said, hey, come, uh, what are you doing? It's Friday night. What are you doing Saturday morning? Okay, come on my private jet. I'm going to take you to California with me. Yeah. Uh, here, you want to stay with your girlfriend at this mansion that I'm not using in, you know, X, Y, Z. So Jeremy was explaining this. It's like the equivalent of like a like a luxury suite at a, at a sports arena. Yeah. Like same, it's, same thing. it's for getting deals done. So, but they're operating at a different level where it's like, oh, these influence. And some founders, the smart ones, don't let... Uh, like Sam Walton, you know, he's like, don't give us, don't give me a freaking gift. Right, just, just right, right. That's what? why, like, the whole, everything in Bentonville is like, you can't, like, come in here and, like, Because they know me. it works. Yeah. If you yeah, give right, a Walmart salesperson, like, a bottle of gin or something, it's going to yeah. influence him where he's just like, I want your price. You guys yeah. did a great job in your episodes. Like, tell me your lowest price, and then I'm going to go to your, it better be your low price, because yeah. I'm going to this guy, and if you tell me a dollar, he sells me 98 cents. Don't waste my time. I'm going. Yeah. I'm not. You're yeah. not going to hear from me again. I have an obligation to the customer to do this to find the lowest price for them. Yeah, because everything, his entire thing, the low cost structure thing. That's that's not that's a Walton thing. That's a sole price thing. That's a Jeff Bezos thing. That's a Rockefeller thing. That's a, that's the most common theme in the history of entrepreneurship. Every single thing. Jeff is like, we're going to have a lowest cost structure. We're going to have a low cost structure. We're going to be efficient. Yep. We're going to be efficient. Somewhere along the line, 25 years later, now the startup, the technology startups, is like, we can just spread money all the time because there's no interest rate. Like, there's just right. money coming back. Well, he and built they, Amazon at a pretty different time than founders today. The business laws of physics were different when there were interest rates yeah. versus when there weren't. Like, well, he started when there were none. That's true. And, Am- the, and, Am- then, and then the environment changed as he was building it. Yep. But like... You know, that while it would have been stupid for Amazon to spend a hundred million dollars on something on, on like crazy marketing activities in nineteen ninety seven, like you could imagine that in twenty eighteen, if all of your competitors had raised a billion dollars and were, you know, uh, trying to chase market share as fast as possible, you either have to exit that market because you're gonna lose, or play that game on the field. Or find and even better, find a different way. Like be more resourceful, but like be more resourceful. It's like a it's it's easy to say, but like uh, hiring all when all your competitors are hiring all the best engineers by throwing a million dollars a year at them. Like yeah. you're just not going to be able to gil- build a good product if you don't try to play that game. Also, yeah, for sure. But like the whole thing, like when Peter Thiel says this in his book, Paul Graham says it. It's just like startups don't have the advantage, right? Of you're not going to out spend Microsoft or Netflix on So you got to find underdeveloped talent, right? You got to mm. find these people that if they were the credentialed or if they were the well-knowns, then they're going to go take, they're not gonna, you're going to work for me $80,000 and some stock options or go make a million dollars a year at Netflix. Like they're going to, so that's the whole thing. It's like, you, you're not going to win unless you are ca- capable of finding underdeveloped talent. Silicon Valley used to be able to build uh, high growth and profitable startups. Well, the, the rule used to be you couldn't go public until you had over $100 million in revenue and you were profitable. Like, if you didn't and, hit both, and, check both of those boxes, you weren't going to IPO. And in 2021, of all the companies that went public, it had to be single-digit percentage that were profitable. Were if any that. of them? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's crazy. The, the, the game just changes. Well, to your point, if you have free money, you know, the money supply grass like expands, it's raining down, That that's going to build. Did you listen to Doug Leone on, I know you guys had him on your show, yeah. but did you hear him on Invest Like the Best? Yeah, he was great. Like, he said, he's like, this. Is, he was telling crazy stories. I loved everything about that guy. I loved him when I heard him on your podcast too. It was like that tough love. This is what I'm into, right? And uh, he, he still has, I I think maybe my favorite quote of all, favorite quote uh, said live on an acquired podcast of you could burn cigarettes in our arms and, and we, we wouldn't, wouldn't flinch. flinch. <laughs> the great, And then he has a great line. He's like, I want you to know we were killers. We, were so killers. we weren't yeah, killers yeah, yeah. to make the most money. We were killers to get the job done. But his, he made the point and you know, very few people probably know more about the venture industry than that guy, right? One of, one of I would imagine he's up there. Um, and he's like, of course, like you have money raining down. He didn't use that word. He's like, it's just creates bad habits. Yeah. yeah. It is crazy how many things in my life I falsely attributed to something that were not just interest rates. Mm-hmm. Like so many things, yeah. the answer is just like, oh, it is that way because we live in a zero interest rate environment. And, and I, the human brain likes to tell stories. And at the end of the day, it's like, Things are the way they are because of mean reversion and what the current interest rate climate is. I wish I'm going to pull up something like this is what I mean. Goes back to Buffett. Like if you just we should have. I wish I knew this. I had read this. I didn't remember it though. This is Warren Buffett on interest rates. Right? He says. Oh, is this from Laws uh, of Gravity? uh, The log in Snowball. No, this is from his uh, uh, 
shareholder letters in eight, oh, he said okay. in 84, 88, something I think, like this. I think the intro to Snowball, I think the scene that opened, the vignette that opens it is Sun Valley right before the bubble bur- the tech bubble burst. Oh, no, this is like decade and a half before. Oh, okay, okay. This great, is great, why great. it's like so, it's like, God, like you could have made you such better decisions. I could have made such better decisions if you had just known this and he had known it for 40 years before it happened. I posted this um, on Twitter and I open up the next day. I'm like, why does this have two and a half million views? And it's like Elon replied. He goes, yep. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, what the, f-? like, what the, like, damn, these people really like interest that's, that's, rates. Uh, that's Paul Graham replies on, st- on so, steroids. <laughs> so I go, Warren Buffett on interest rates, and the, the, the headline is, they power everything in the economic universe. So that was what uh, Elon was responding up to. And this is Warren writing in the 80s. The value of every, to your, exactly what you're saying, the value of every business, the value of a farm, an apartment house, or any other economic asset is 100% sensitive to interest rates. That's because all you're doing when you're investing is transferring money to someone now in exchange for a stream of money which you expect to come back in the future. And the higher the interest rates are, the less that present value will be. Interest. This is fantastic. Interest rates are to asset prices, prices sort of like gravity is to an apple. Yeah. When interest rates are low, there is little gravitational pull on in- on asset prices. We just yeah. fucking live through this, right? Totally. When interest when interest textbook. Yeah, when interest rates are low, there is little gravitational pull on asset prices. Interest rates power everything in the economic universe. Because I found that because all this this remember the inflation went crazy like a year or two ago, or whatever. And I was like, okay, well, every time that happens, all I do is I have um. You can buy the Kindle version of Buffett shareholder letters for like two bucks. I know it's crazy. And I search it for like interest rates, inflation, oh, and I just go and I read, okay, this oh, is you what- You made a billion dollars off that $2 purchase. There you go. And so like, you'll say, okay, this is what he said inflation. And then you see what year he said it. And it's just like, and that's where I found that. I go, what do you say about interest rates? Boom, 1980, whatever. Mm-hmm. And he just laid out- exa- and then, It's so and funny because what he, what he also did right there is for every college finance sophomore that's having to go through a class to do DCFs and they're like, I don't understand this. This is complicated. Like he just explained conceptually a discounted cash flow model there in a way that was like unbelievably digestible. He's so good at that. The clarity of thought. Because he wants the microphone. But now, but <laughs> also like he just educated you in a way that makes more sense and is interesting and you're entertained by and you might build a business off that and then you might want to sell one day or yep. whatever the case is. Yep. It's like the, the this is where uh, I'm spending a lot more time of like really trying to work on storytelling ability and concision, right? Yeah. Um, the, the the value is in the compression and the distillation, right? If you could listen to like uh, an audiobook for 25 hours, but if I can give you the best idea or one idea that changes your life and I can do it, you know, every week or whatever, like in a couple minutes, like that is going, that some of that value is yeah. going to be brought back to me. What- and all that comes from is th- what I realize is all my heroes have like, what they have in common is like the unbelievable clarity of thought. Like Steve Jobs, Charlie, yeah. Mo- like you're not gonna be like, oh, what does that mean? They take unbelievably complex things, like you're not advertising to a standing army, you're advertising to a moving parade, make it in a memorable way, yeah. and then you carry that maxim with you forever. How do you get better at that? You said you're working on it. Reps, just straight up reps, like thinking about it, and then hearing yourself back. So the, the advantage I have that I edit is yeah, I, I you can he- say something and like, oh, that was so good, and then you hear it back, and sometimes it's even better, or many times it's worse. It's yeah. like, oh, I lost. I was. I know what I'm saying. Yeah. But I, they're not. They have no fuck. You miss this part that doesn't make any sense. And so normally I have to cut it. I, I don't think I've ever re. I don't think I've ever re-recorded. Ooh, something. We only did that for one episode ever. It's really hard to do. What yeah. re-record? Yeah. Do you know which episode we did it for? No. It was recent. Mm. NFL. David and I got on and re-recorded 40 minutes of material over maybe 15 different parts of the episode. The, the original recording of that episode was really rough. The, the NFL episode was too long It when we started. It took way too long to get to the interesting part, the Pete Rozelle era. And so we had this like massively bloated beginning and then we had a story arc that didn't cleanly resolve, and we had a bunch of concepts where we didn't nail the explanation. Yeah. And so we went in, we cut like half of the first epoch of the story. We recorded n- new bits to like create nice rising action and resolution on the Roselle era, and then we recorded another like like ten areas where we were just like, this wasn't said super tight. And I'm 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 really curious if people noticed because we had to like we basically had to voice act 
Like we had to listen to the way that we sort of came into that segment, get that in our head. This was your your theater background, yeah. like coming in, <laughs> and then like pick it up from there. But uh, no, I, yeah, your editing is so good. Like when we we've talked about like back catalog sponsorship, and you told me what you're doing was like Zoom Info, and I've been listening to your back catalog, and it's like, dude, it's like it sounds like it it was there the day you did it. It is perfect. And I know because we talk about yeah. this that that was not that ad was not there. Yeah. But it sounds like it's there. That's the goal. That that the, the NFL episode is what I meant of like it's a crazy story but even there is like a lesson where like you guys told and I checked I texted to you like totally changed the way I think about things or maybe we were talking on Zoom about this. Um, where it's like, I never even thought of that. The NFL is like the largest media company. Yeah, yeah. I it's... hadn't either. <laughs> and the funny thing is that's like that was a David Rosenthal insight that like uh, it's it, it's that the NFL is the single largest media property by value. And the funny thing is, if you go look at the, because we did this for the uh, Nintendo episode, you go look at the largest media properties, uh, they list Mario, uh, they Pokemon. list Pokemon, and, they li- and then, and I think if you sort, the, the list includes like video games and movies. And so there's like the MCU in there and there's Star Wars in there, but like they don't think, the NFL is way bigger than all of those, yeah. but it's not on the list because people don't think of it as like a media That's, property. I, the I way love they looking for others. stuff like that, both to do episodes on and as um, for, for investing too. Is like, what is something that is just so like in the air that people don't even realize yes. what it is? Or what's a comparison we can make that is super eye opening, but people haven't thought to compare those two things before? Yeah. Which is why I tie things into past. Because it's like, oh, this yeah. the, episode two forty four. The idea, no, but the idea behind this is like we've seen this before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I reread like the show notes on like the Johnny Ive episode I did. Johnny said something was great, and uh, he said uh, he goes one of Steve's talents was identifying markets full of second rate products. Mm, yeah, and so like he yeah, would like, yeah. oh, there's the opportunity here, and we're both we're all podcast addicts, right? Yep. And the reason that we get along, and is it's because, a market full of second rate products, and because you know how hard it is to do. Yeah. And when you go and listen to other business podcasts and like I had a friend, um, his friend has a podcast and he's like, hey, these three guys, they have large social media followings, but it does not translate to episodes, which R- people rarely, don't understand. Yeah, rarely will. Yeah. And they're like, would you listen to their episode and give it feedback? Right. And we went to, like, so I was like, yeah, I listened to it. And I go, um, it's three guys sitting around talking, whatever happens to pop to their mind. What did you expect to happen? Which is kind of what's happening <laughs> Which is here. Kind of, I was, like, I was no, thinking no, no. the same thing. I was like, like oh, wait, we need to some all listeners, we apologize. No, no, this no. episode lacks there's, craft. There's zero <laughs> chance that people aren't, the people interested in entrepreneurship and investing are not finding this interesting yeah. because the prep for this is not three guys that have a million other things to do. Right. It's three guys that Spent do this the last all eight the time years doing this. Yeah. Right. over and over again and have weird shit that's going to cop up naturally in a, in a conversation that you can, like, oh, I didn't know about this. Maybe there's a bunch of people probably like, I didn't know who Evan Land was. I didn't know Ogilvy. I never yeah. thought about the NFL as uh, as a, the it's largest media business. company. Yep. Like, so, no, but their problem thing is like, there's no value proposition. This is actually something that I think ties into much of what we've talked about over the last couple of hours. People are going to do what they want to do. Mm-hmm. And if... People can do what they want to do and are given unfettered freedom to run it. They can do great things. If people are forced to do things that they don't want to do, they're not going to make great things. Yep. Or, or either forced to or choose, put themselves in a situation for whatever reason where they're doing something mm-hmm. they don't want to be doing. They're not going to be very good at it. I, I think that's one of the reasons why we find ourselves so attracted to episodes that highlight craft is because that's sort of like how we think about Acquired. Like if LVMH, Benchmark, it's like, People who do few things but do them exceptionally well are just so entrancing to yeah. study. I think this goes back to what you were just saying, like, and I want to go to the craft things. Like Charlie again has these simple ideas. Like most of the problems are that you're just not intensely interested in what you're working on. Yeah. And he's like, I don't care how smart you are. And Charlie's smarter than almost everybody else. He goes, I was not successful until I moved myself into a position where I worked on something I was intentionally interested in. That just mm. these like small yeah. rules carry most of of, of yeah. the weight. It's like how bad do you actually want it? And if you're not willing to do those things, then there's nothing wrong with that. Like entrepreneurship is for a very small percentage. I, I'm not one of these people who think everybody can be an entrepreneur. I would like to see more of them, but it, it there's no safety net. It's like no one's telling you what to do. Yep. No one had to tell you guys, hey, you should uh, buy microphones and do a bunch of research and pick well, a name. We didn't name. buy microphones to start. <laughs> oh, yeah. But like, well, the, yeah. The, um, I think the most interesting thing is that like, 
I think we've talked about this concept before on air, is that uh, if someone's going to advise you on starting a podcast, they would say do a 30 to 40 minute episode and mm-hmm. like do it weekly. You Have know, so there's and you release it at the same time all the time. Have a guest so that way that person promotes it too. And we're like, okay, well, we do the opposite of all of those things. And I think it's like my the conclusion I've come to is advice is an average, and uh, and reality is a distribution. And averages suck because they hide the distribution. You kind of want to know the shape of the distribution, and you kind of want to know like things that apply to your specific data point, not like the average thing. And I think like adv- advice is always an average that hides the distribution. And if you know that you're actually an outlier in some way, then you have to sort of like selectively follow advice because it may not apply to you. Charlie told me a fantastic story about this where he's just like he was singing the praises of BYD that they're kicking ass. Like he told me like the the not just me. I'm mean, I mean, with a group of people. Um, they make batteries for cars. They make cars. Yeah, but he started yeah. out like, like uh, doing like knockoff cell phones in Korea or something, yeah. and then like he he the, I forgot the guy's founder's name, and I apologize, but like he was telling me the life story. But he was saying that the founder that Charlie and Lee Lu Lu Lee Lee Lu gave the founder advice, and he ignored it. And he was right. He's like, don't go in electric cars or whatever it was yeah, that yeah. he did. He's like, and he, you know, selling, I think he said like 2 billion cars. Like, I forgot what, 2 million cars. Not, there's no way he sold 2 billion cars in a year. So like, he's like sold 2 million cars China is in a big China. market. Yeah. yeah, so he's just like, and he did it. Uh, and uh, he gets all the credit because Lee and me told him not to do it. Yeah. And he's just like, same to your point. It's game tape. It's just like when Kobe is watching this particular particular play of Michael Jordan, that may never appear in his life. Yeah. And maybe the, the move he did wasn't the right move for what Kobe did, but maybe it influences his other thing. It's yeah. just like, the life is complex and messy. And like, you can think you're really smart and until you have a two and a half year old and they ask you, why is that the way? And you answer the question. <laughs> and then their follow-up question is going to be why. And eventually yeah. you're going to get to a level where like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know why. It's Everything like a, ends and I yeah, don't know. It's like, I don't know. And so, th- like, of course, there's no certainty. Like, yeah. th- that's why if you have to, if you crave certainty, you've got to get a job. But I, there wasn't even Facebook when I was in college. I went to a shitty college because I had to work full time. I went at night. But um, uh, so my college did not have Facebook. It was just coming out. So we had MySpace. And my MySpace, uh, you could put a quote, right? Like at, at right. the header. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And I've always thought like this for my entire life. It was like, there's no security in life, only opportunity. And I mm. think that's what you, so investors and entrepreneurs are are going for opportunity at the expense of security. And if you need security, you can get a job, but we see like, everybody said, go into tech, go into tech, go into tech. Oh, Look, man. you make all this money. Oh, yeah. I think this is a super mispriced thing. I, I think people who crave security, which I get, like all humans crave some level yeah. of security, um, mis, sort of misprice security because no jobs are as secure as we think they are, but they definitely cap your upside. And, and people, it's like, is founding a company or going into business for yourself as an entrepreneur extremely risky? Yes, it is. But is it actually that much riskier than a job where you could get laid off or the sector could go through a downfall? Or like, there are a lot of things about having a job that are not nearly as secure as people think they are. Steve Wozniak and Jobs, they're like, worst case scenario, if this doesn't work, we'll just go get jobs. We, right. We're broke anyways. Right. Like, well, let's just try. And he like sells his van for like fifty. Steve sells his van for like fifteen hundred dollars. Like, oh, I'm just all in on Apple. Like, I, that's that to me. That's like again. I think a lot of this is like people are asked. It's like it's entrepreneurship. Like innate. It can it be taught. Can there be a school of entrepreneurship? And I was like, well, ask Charlie Munger if he taught uh, a business class. What What did he say? He's like, I would just teach the history of what you guys do. He's like, I would teach the history of a hundred companies, yeah. and I would talk about what went right and what went wrong. Yep. There's no security. There's no. He's not saying, yeah, take my class, and on the other end, you get this degree that guarantees business success. That doesn't exist. Well, that's what's cool. Like, uh, they have been teaching entrepreneurship for the last fifty years. <laughs> so I was in entre- So uh, I went to the UCF, which is this like diploma mill essentially, and they I was in the pilot entrepreneurship program, right, the very first year. And uh, it's a two-year Wait, program. So do you take us back to that? Yeah. Were you thinking about what, what was your relationship to entrepreneurship before starting the Founders Podcast? So, like, I have never been on a job review. I, I've only had two jobs in my life. Like, I was, but I was like, there was no what, what like, entrepreneurship. There was no entrepreneurship like community. There was no entrepreneurship 
industry, right? right. So like my first business was, <laughs> this is a long story, but like um, I had been accustomed, to, I was talking about this yesterday. By the time I was 17, I had been accustomed to working full time and going to school. Right. So like people are like, oh, you work a lot on founders. It's like, I don't have to go to school. I can like do this all the time. <laughs> you're working half time as far yeah, as you're so concerned. It's like, um, there's a long story here. Like that would take me like 30 minutes, but like, um, like my dad sat me down when I was like 15. He's like, listen, you don't have to pay rent, but like, I don't have any money for you. So like, if you want something, you got to go get it. Right. And the good thing about my dad, he's a Cuban immigrant, uh, not educated, but like he, the best piece of advice that he ever gave me and my brother um, was a maxim. He's like, don't half-ass things, hmm. right? So he does it in like a blue collar, he's a truck driver, like, you know, that kind of thing, where he's like, he, he prides himself on the fact that like, uh, like he'll work 72 hours straight, right? But he never made a lot of money and never had an education, like also came from like a shitty family, his mom wasn't good, and whatever. And they had escaped Castro's Cuba. My dad was born in Cuba. Wow. So it's like, imagine like, I talked about this on, um, cause you know, Patrick's at the end of invest, like every invest, like yeah, the best yeah, episode, the, he says, episode with him, yeah, yeah he's like, thing. he's like, uh, what's the nicest thing ever, yeah. ever, some, ever did to you or for you, did to you, <laughs> uh, for you. And I was like, and it just, I'm waiting for him to follow it up with what's the shittiest thing. That <laughs> ever did to you? <laughs> and I was like, man, like something that it was a decision that happened way before I was born. And like my grandfather is in Cuba in 1959, um, 1958. And he, again, not an educated man. He uh, worked as a butcher and worked in a factory to make shoes. Uh, he's married and he's got a baby. That baby is my dad. And Castro comes to power. And he doesn't have a lot of money, doesn't speak English. And yet he had some kind of insight that I need to get the fuck out of here. Hmm. Right? And he goes to a country, picks up, loses everything. Not that you had a lot anyways. <laughs> uh, goes to a country knows nobody, doesn't speak the language. When I sat down, the first thing me and Sam Zell talked about, and I think helped bond us, uh, to the point where at the end he said he liked my energy and everything, but uh, so hopefully he liked me, I don't know, um, was in his story, I was like, cause I had obviously read his autobiography. And one of the first things me and Sam talked about after I said, you're fucking Sam Zell, <laughs> I'm kind of freaking out about that, uh, was Sam, I, I, I understand and empathize with your story because Sam's story, is his dad being Jewish, getting the last train out of Poland before the wow. Nazis bomb it. Wow. Literally the last train out. 18 members of his family, his dad went around to saying, we got to get out of here. This is not good. They're like, no, we're going to stay. They're all dead. Sam, Sam's dad and his mom have a daughter. They get to America. His mom's pregnant. Sam is born in America. Wow. And so in that book, Sam's dad's always telling him, you don't understand how lucky you are to be born here. Yeah. Right? And I was like, I understand that mentality because I grew up meeting, uh, Cubans have this thing called Noche Buena, which is, uh, they don't celebrate, my, I, my wife's Colombian, so they say, I married into a Colombian family, they do this too. They don't celebrate Christmas on Christmas day. They do it the night before. <laughs> it's like mm. Christmas Eve. And so I grew up, you know, for as long as I can remember, I was like eight, seven, 10, 10 years old meeting people that came over on rafts and you would yeah. see these things i've seen these in person right it's just like the rafts think about how great how bad it has to be it's like 50 miles right 90 miles <laughs> right um i'm gonna go over to the study of the university of miami just did on this 90 miles uh you're you're a parent hopefully you might be a parent one day like you love your kids way more than you love yourself oh, like yeah there's people that came, hundreds of thousands of people went to the edge of the island and put their kids on a raft just in hopes that they get to America. And so the problem is, is like you don't make the announcement to the everybody's like, hey, tomorrow we're leaving on a raft. Could you get right. caught? You know, right, right, right. imprisoned or killed or whatever the case is. And so the University of Miami did this study. It was like, well, how many people did this? We know hundreds of thousands survived. Right. And how they estimate that like half, at least I think something like half a million people perished, never wow. got there. There's a the conversation with, um, there's this UFC fighter named Jorge Masvidal who lives in Miami. He's a Cuban guy. And his dad was one of the ones that escaped. It, he went on a, their raft was a, made out of a, like a truck tire. Like, you know, like think of like a size of like a bulldozer tire, right? Yeah, wow. It's his uncle and two 14 year old boys. They get off path, right? They run out of their water, wind up being like uh, contaminated. So they, you can't drink, you'll die. How do they propel drink. it anyway? Like, how do you make sure it gets to Florida? Uh, so you have like, they, some have oars and some have like, like, see that blanket over there? Like, yeah. you try to make a, uh, 
uh, a sale, a sale out of like a Whoa. blanket or something. you know, there some of these are unbelievably in in like the the level of ingenuity is like yeah for uneducated they don't have the internet like they don't it's an unbelievable, and so there in his case they I know they had oars I think they had a um a sail, they get close enough to the Bahamas they they haven't drink water for like three or four days or something. A pigeon lands on the oar. They wind up killing the pigeon, opening it apart and drinking the blood. That's the only thing that's saved. And so now his, so he gets to America, eventually gets to go from the Bahamas to America. Now his son is like, you know, makes millions and millions of dollars, wow. like as a professional fighter and a celebrity and, hmm. and, and all this other stuff. So anyways, long story short, uh, the one thing like I, my dad's still alive. I told you my mom passed away. Um, but like, I really think like my dad for just, like he did not baby me at all. He's just like, you gotta, you want shit? Like figure out how to get a job. Yeah. And so I worked at, um, back then, this, this is something that Paul Graham made the point of, right? Um, he's like, dude, when I was a kid, like you had to, like the only jobs available were you like, you had to scoop ice cream or something. And like, you've probably met them. I met some 17 year old founders, a bunch of founders. Well, you talk to them and they're on their second company. I'm like, what? They're like, oh yeah, when I was like ninth grade, I like did this like Gmail plugin or yeah, like, right. yeah. it's like I made forty. I had this SaaS tool. <laughs> yeah, I made forty thousand dollars a month, and like my I was making so much money. My parents let me drop out of high school so I can uh, do this business. I'm like, I worked at a car wash, dude. I made four dollars <laughs> and sixty five cents an hour, you know. Um, so, anyways, long story short, um, I uh, I would go to school year round, right? Because I had figured this out where it's like, oh. Um, if you, uh, most people went to summer school, they were forced to, I went to public school my whole life, right? Yep, and so did. like people would go to public school, they would be forced to because you failed something else. But if you elected to do that in six weeks, you get a full semester's credit and there's two mm. six week yeah, terms. Yeah, like mini semesters. So I always, even when I was in college, I did this. I would go to school year round, right? And so in high school, I went to school so much that by the time I got to my last two years of high school, I was in this program called OJT, which is on the job training. So instead of having six periods, you would leave after the fourth period and you'd have to have a job and you would get two uh, your other credits um, through your employer. So your employer would have to like fill out paperwork. Like is David, you know, cleaning dog shit very well in these cars? And like, oh, there's a baby that came in and threw up. He did a good job with that. It was disgusting. But the, the benefit of that was being able to work full time, oh, full time, yep. um, make enough money where I could like buy, I bought like a new car with my own money, like all that other stuff. Um, and so like, then I realized like, oh, like I think I was making like 400 or $500 a week in high school, which is freaking really yeah. good. This is like late nineties, early two thousands. Um, and then I was, got promoted to being a detailer and that's like, you have client list and then you start developing relationships. And it's like every other business, like, right. And they're like, it's Hey, I love what sales. you do. Would you do this at my house or would you do it on my boat that you don't do or like yeah. whatever. And so my first business was just detailing cars and boats and, and taking all this other stuff where it's like, okay, I spend an hour waxing this guy's car. I might make 20 bucks. I do it at his house. I make $150. And so like, I've always just had that. Like, and I, again, there was just not like, this is the story you guys read in the books and the history, the story is it's like, there's no master plan here. Yeah. It's like, Hey, I need to make the money. Opportunity. All of Take my it. other friends were working at McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, where you just said something like they cap. Yep. You're, I never had a capped upside. Right. Um, and then so I, I did all these other businesses. I started in, uh, in college because I thought I was going to be a lawyer. And this is so silly because everybody, all my friends that are lawyers hate it. Right. I dodged a bullet there. I, I, well, this is the, that's the dream. Like the, the immigrant dream is for like their kids to become lawyers and doctors. Well, right? my parents, not my parents. So. Uh. My parents never said the word college to me once, hmm. not one time, because they're both high school dropouts. So like, um, ne they they never like I was one of the only kids in high school and they didn't have a uh, uh, a curfew. Like my parents knew I was independent and left me. They gave uh, that's the best thing they did. It's yeah, like oh, David yeah, yeah. can take care of himself. Yeah. They thought my mom told me she's like I just thought you were a lot smarter than everybody else in our family. So the, the, like <laughs> we trusted when, you when to she, make the right decision. Well, I was also driven too, but she um. Because you have to understand, like, being smart in this family is not, like, being, like, the, the bar is low in the sense that, like, they're, they're both coming from multiple generations of people that did not prioritize education or self-improvement. So that's why I'm so, like, ferocious in this, because I didn't see that, you know? Yeah. And so um, the, the, this, this demonstrated when my mom was dying of cancer. Um, so, like, you know, HIPAA has this thing where, like, they're not going to share paperwork or information unless, like, it gets permission from the person. And, like... 
my mom could choose whoever she wanted to. She could have chose her husband, right? They had a bad relationship. They should have got, they got divorced and then remarried. They should have stayed divorced, but whatever. And she, you see that with actions. We said actions express priority. She's like, we're in there. And she's like, who do you want the paperwork? Like, who do you want us to communicate? She's like, David, not her other kids, not her husband, not her sister. Not, and she trusted me implicitly. Um, and so I, I, I essentially like, they never met to college. So I just kept this routine. I was like, people are like, oh, um, they're like, what do you want to do for a living? And like, I remember watching TV when I was younger. I was like, well, I want to be rich. And you think when you're younger, you don't know anything. Like, who's rich on TV? Like, I liked Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I was like, you'd oh, be yeah. a judge or a doctor. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I, I can't see blood. Like, that freaks me out. So I could be an attorney. Okay. So I went to school uh, and I worked full time and I was trying to do hustle, anything I could do. And so the idea was like, okay, I'm just going to go undergrad for business because I'm interested in business anyways. And, but I'm only doing that till I get, uh, till I go to law school, right? Mm. And um, the point of the story was not to go on this deviation, but I was in the entrepreneurship program, the pilot one, right? Because I was already interested in trying to make money in any right. way possible. Um, and this is how bad the entrepreneurship was. And this is why I'm kind of jealous of these young kids where now you actually have an entrepreneurship industry and there's, uh, there's stuff you could learn from. The head, the main the, the, what is it called? Like the main subject, Entrepreneurship 101, right? The curriculum. Yeah, but there's all these other classes, but Entrepreneurship 101 is run the teacher, right? Mm. What is her credentials? Her dad started a, um, an AC company in Florida. You're going to make a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, that's a good And market. he died on the job because he got electrocuted to death. Oh, God. And she inherited the company, and then she ran it, and so she's the teacher. And so, like, the curriculum okay. was terrible. It was terrible. <laughs> the best thing, and this relates to what all we do for a living now, which I could have never predicted, is there was a guy that, um, this is, this is kind of like Charlie, Charlie Munger says you should read, if you want to learn about incentives in a really difficult business, read Les Schwab's autobiography, which I did because mm, Charlie told yeah, me yeah, to. Yeah. did it, like, episode a long time ago. And he's like, this guy made a ton of money in a really hard business, which is, like, tires and, like, yeah, oil yeah, changes yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. And so the guy was coming into the class. He was going to donate like three or $5 million to have a building named after him. And he had one prerequisite. He goes, I want to talk to your entrepreneurship students before I, before I give you this money. And I learned more in one hour from that dude than I did in two years on entrepreneurship because he would talk for like 20 minutes and then he's like, open up your questions. Yeah. And I fucking lit him up with question <laughs> after question after question. <laughs> and I remember to this day, just like the simple way, this is like, you know, he was building his business in the probably the 80s and 90s. And he's like, um, how did you know where to expand? And he's like, we would pull the car registration data from the DMVs, mm. right? And we would know how many car owners there were in this specific radius. And it, we'd have to hit, like, let's say we need 40,000 car owners in a three mile radius. There's, are there any other stores? Put a store right there. And they yeah. did that over and over and over oh, and over that's again. awesome. Yeah, and so like he had ideas like that and just like, Again, you learn through experience. Like that guy could teach us way more because yeah. he actually did this compared to. We, okay. uh, I, I think probably all three of us have a like unintended uh, impact of college entrepreneurship programs on us. I mean, you definitely. I, do. I have a minor in entrepreneurship. Yeah. For, really? Yeah, from Ohio State. Similarly, only ever went to public school. Yeah. Uh, I, knew, I I was a little different. Like I I was really into computers. Like in yeah. I, when I was ten. My dad and I found a um, PC on the side of the road, and he was like, do you want to install Linux? And I was like, what's Linux? And like, t- taught me to use a <laughs> terminal. Like, I was really lucky yeah. to have a dad who's an engineer. And and so I went to college for computer science. But you, Wait, wait, wait. I, Back up. You found a PC on the side of the road? <laughs> 100%. And you were and like, was like, let's literally install said, Linux? And my dad's like, I'm willing to bet that thing is just old. Yeah. Like He's like, because we're looking at the, you know, you like, that, that at that point you could open computers. So we're like looking at it. He kind of like, Pucks it apart, looks inside, he's like, it's got all the pieces. Like, this is That's just amazing. an old computer that someone's <laughs> throwing away. <laughs> That's amazing. All right, keep so, going. So, but, you, you but, majored in computer science? Yeah, but okay. I, I, I like went in thinking, like, I want to have some kind of like, I want to do business and tech, but I didn't know what yeah. that meant. And so, I found my way to a, um, a club called the Business Builders Club, and they were like, oh, there's like a real, like a, an actual minor that you can take. And so, sort of like through student organizations, found my way to actually g- doing something in the College of Business, which like, I go back and forth on whether undergraduate business stuff is useful. Because on the one hand... But it got like, you plugged into your network. It's, all your it's, buddies it's all about like, people. You guys have all totally. done amazing things. We just things. came back from my bachelor party and half the crew is the Business Builders Club, Ohio yeah. State friends that I made there. 
the content sucks, but yeah, the relationships right, right, because, are everything. But yeah. the it's relationship, like how, that's but, what, yeah. And it's not, the, it, the stuff you're learning is actually super important, but you don't have the context for why yet. It's like you're working on a DCF model and you're like, uh, I don't, this is useless to me. Yeah. Or you're like learning about depreciation and amortization. You're like, this is awful because I have nothing. Whereas my physics classes were awesome. Like there's labs. Like I can touch and feel the things and understand uh, mechanical advantage and yeah. how the free body diagram works. But in these business concepts, they're like super abstract, and it's I, they weren't useful to me then. But like I went and took a Coursera class last year, two years ago, on accounting because I was just like, okay, like I want to actually understand accounting. In part because we talk about it on Acquired all the time, and David <laughs> understands this stuff more than I do, and I hate it. But like, it, it, it is so much more useful when you understand where the rubber meets the road in the real world. It, you know? Like, it would just be beneficial, just like go out and try to sell something. Like, you yes. know what I mean? Like in class, like yeah. get real world experience. Like, what what did Charlie? Uh, I just reread. Have you guys read the Tao of Charlie Munger? No, okay. I've heard it's good. I, okay, I, I can't you got looked I, at it for the episode or not? I, I might have. I own the hardcover. The Kindle and the audiobook. That should tell you, like, it's worth it. Um, By the way, I own the audiobook and the Kindle of almost every book that I own. I, uh, in, including the hardcover too? No. I oh, don't so own that many books. You're, you're not a hardcover okay. person. Yeah. Oh, because you can also switch. Yep. That's the Whisper Sync or whatever it's and, called. And all the time, I actually hate that they sync and they, because it, like, my common workflow in doing acquired research is I listen to the book and then. I'll take some notes in Apple Notes of like like half quotes where I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, I got to look this up later. And then I go back in the Kindle and I search for the actual quote mm-hmm. and like pull out the data to be able to use it in the episodes. Um, I think listening to the audiobook before reading the book is very helpful. It gives yeah. you a basic overview. It's almost yeah, like reading yeah, yeah. a Wikipedia page before you read the biography. It's not enough detail, but like you have, okay, yes. you have, uh, you're like watching a movie for the second or third time, you know how it ends and it mm-hmm. gives you, you pick up on things you missed the first time. Yep. Um, in the tale of Charlie Munger, though, Charlie was talking about this where he's just like, I learned about business at the Buffett grocery store, right, from yep. the cash register. Mm. And it's like, because that money is the lifeblood of all, I think the quote in the book is like, money is the lifeblood of all businesses, and that's where the cash, that's where the money was at this point. Yep. And it's like you just learn, and he says, like, you learn the importance of basic shit, like showing up on time, how to work with people you don't like, like how to uh, service, a, like take care of your customers. Like these are things that are all like universally applicable yep. that there, there's an, it's another form of education. Like that's the biggest, mm. the key of experience and why it's so important. It's the most valuable uh, ed- form of education because it's ed- education of life. Yep. Yeah. Like I love to read like more than almost anybody else. <laughs> like you guys obviously love to read. There's there's just so much things you can't learn from books. So it's just like it's not enough. Mm. David, what was your college entrepreneurship? Well, it's funny. It's more thematic than uh, an actual impact. But um, I can't remember if I've talked about this before. Uh, Princeton had and then just one entrepreneurship class. It was like one class in the Department of Electrical Engineering. <laughs> I was not an electrical engineer, but people knew about this because like, oh, this is cool. Right. And I uh, so senior year, I had already. The recruiting happened in the fall, so I was already like had my job, investment banking job that I was going to go do. Yep, you know, so, <laughs> a whole other can of worms. But um, I was like, oh, you know, I'll take this class. It's supposed to be good. I'm going to go work on Wall Street. I should learn about high tech entrepreneurship. Was the name of the class, and um, it was like all you know, guest lecture. It was it was case best, case, right. case method, mm-hmm. and uh, Ed Chow, the professor, would have guests come in. One of the guests, either the last or like the second to last class, was Tim Ferriss. <laughs> what? Right before he published the Four Hour Work No week. way. Yes. <laughs> he, get, he gave he get, he asked Buffett a question, at and he has a meeting. Guest lecture at Princeton. And this is what, and, and this, oh, he he totally hustled this. He like traded on that name for yeah. like years before he made it as Tim Ferriss. Because he just he was, went in for one class. He come, it was one class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was one one day of. <laughs> One course, That's and amazing. that was like this case study class. And I think he had taken the class when he was <laughs> at Princeton. And Ed, the professor, like liked him and kind of took oh, a shine to him. So you and I are then are guest lecturers at Columbia. Oh and... yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, we're yeah we're guest lecturers <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> so he came in, and and so he was working on the book, but it was like done, but like was about to get published. And so he came in, and the whole like class was like basically. Telling his story and then like showing the book. I remember in my notes, like for the class, I, I titled them. I have them still somewhere on my on an old computer. The title was Supplement Guy. <laughs> <laughs> do what you love. Yeah, that do is the moral what of the you story. love. Oh my god! It was, and then oh man, afterwards, ah, uh, talking about missed opportunities. He, uh, he he was he's like he's older than me, but he's not that much older. So he's right? only been out for yeah, a couple yeah. years. So. 
class ends and he was like, hey guys, anybody want to hang out? Like, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go like hang at Terrace. Like if you want to come to uh, Princeton has eating clubs instead of, they do have fraternities, but like uh, yeah. one of them is Terrace and uh, Jenny was actually in Terrace. And, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was like, uh, basically I'm going to go like hang out and have a good time with anybody who wants to come along. And I was like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> now I'll see you on the podcast now circuit later. <laughs> yeah, but exactly. I, I love how this just was uncovered in random conversation, right? It was just like computer science, investment banking, law, yeah. No, but like no, no common denominator. No, yeah. and, and like and look where I like, use theater more than I use computer science. Yeah. So, like that so was what I yeah. I like the idea of like from venture capitalists and podcasters, right? Um I went and uh <laughs> my daughter asked me to go speak at um at Career Day. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> and this was last year so she would have been That's like she the greatest been, thing. She would have been fourth grade, right? I can't wait. And so she's like, well, daddy, like you have a weird job. Like, will you <laughs> come in? A weird job. Yeah. She's like, will you come in and like give a talk? And so you mentioned earlier, like entrepreneurs are like odd ducks and like crazy people. They don't like, they don't like, they see rules. It's like, oh, that's just words written down on paper. Like I'll just do my own thing. So I show up and I was like, yeah, I'll do anything for you. Like whatever you want. Um, and so I show up and the, there's two, she, the, each class at the school she has has two teachers. Right. And so they're like, oh, well, we didn't, hi, Mr. Center. We didn't get your email. Uh, did you get like, did you bring like a thumb drive? I'm like, what was I supposed to email and why would I have a thumb drive? <laughs> and they're like, you're a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> and I go, they're... Have you ever made a PowerPoint presentation Never. in your life? No. And I go, no, but this is right. I go, they're nine. Why would I make a PowerPoint presentation? <laughs> <laughs> and so I go there and I was like, I was like, listen, I'm fine. Like I'll wing, like I got this. Like they're like, you're going to wing it. They didn't use the word wing it, but I forgot what it was. So you're like, no, really? I, I got this. I show up. Right. And they're all like sitting on the floor. And there's like 39 year olds. Like, are you like stand up? No, 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 never. <laughs> okay. And so um, I want to see some energy. <laughs> and I was like, I talk for two minutes, right? I have 30 minutes slot. I go, uh, I talk for two minutes. I was like, listen, um, don't listen to your parents. Don't listen. To, <laughs> don't, don't listen to your teachers. I go follow whatever you're intensely. I just gave Charlie Munger's advice. Yeah, I go, yeah, what yeah. are you interested in? Keep following that, even if it doesn't, you don't, there's not an, an obvious career path. It's And I use the word, I go, it's highly likely that the job that you're going to have has not yet been invented. Yeah. I was like, there was no such thing as a podcaster. Like, I couldn't go to yeah, school for podcasting. Yeah, they're all going to be prompt engineers. Yeah. Or, what, <laughs> go, or whatever. And like, so that was like the two-minute summary, and I said a little bit more than that. I go, okay, now what questions do you have for me? And so I spent the next 28 minutes. I told them the importance of reading. I was like, yeah. listen, your friends are all going to be in these stupid apps. I was like, you're going to have no attention span. Learn how to read and read whatever you're interested in. Um, <laughs> Meanwhile, your daughter's probably like, oh, no, my she, God. So I'll tell you the funny thing. <laughs> so then 28 minutes, and then they're telling me about books they love. They're like, oh, I like Harry Potter, and I like this, and I like travel. And we had, like, the greatest time, right? So I come back. I see – this is, like, 9 in the morning. I leave. Um, and I, my daughter gets out, you know, later on in the day. And she goes, Daddy, thank you very much. The, my friends thought your talk was the best. I was like, oh, that's like interesting. Like that's, I'm glad they liked it. I go, well, let me ask you a question. Who came after me? And they're like, oh, it was like, you know, John's mom or something. I was like, oh, what does John's mom do? She's like, uh, I go, well, first of all, did she do a PowerPoint? She goes, yes, everybody did a PowerPoint. <laughs> and I go, what does John's mom do? She goes, oh, she's a corporate attorney. I'm like, yeah. so you like... They're nine years old. And, and also, have... that's like the alternate future for you. Yeah. Like it was like, <laughs> yeah. you would have had a PowerPoint. It was like Bizarro David going I know. after you. Yeah, it would, it'd be interesting like what you would, uh... yeah, but then again, I was li I was living in Florida and like the law there is not a lot, of, like you'd have to move to like <laughs> DC. Like the law there is like insurance. Like, so yeah. I'm at the San Francisco airport, right? Which is way nicer than Miami International Airport, by the way. It's oh, like I've never been to Miami. Oh, International it's like third world, man. It's really? like the ceilings are low. They have the new, ver they built like this new part, but SFO is way nicer than mine. And I see this billboard of, it says the world's, or the America's largest personal injury attorney. That guy was in Orlando. I was going to school in Orlando at the time. His name's John Morgan. He was famous back then, and now he has. So like that, I would oh, probably, wow. probably work for him. Like I'm like yeah. chasing ambulances or whatever. No, no disrespect. <laughs> like whatever you got to do to, yeah, to yeah. pay your bills. Like I have no problem with that. But um, yeah, I just thought it was funny. I was like, you also have to think independently. Like they're nine years old. Like they don't want to sit through. Did you? I don't even want to sit through a PowerPoint. <laughs> certainly when, nobody when wants to sit through a PowerPoint. No, you should like try to like. I would have just brought a video game console or something. I was like, let's play video games. <laughs> You know, and maybe you can design your career. Hey, Blake and Mitch, Blake Robbins and Mitch Lasky yeah. made the point in uh, one of their GameCraft episodes that I never even thought of. They're like, you know how hard it is 
how few so- pure software companies are that that do over that sell over a billion dollars a year in software, and how many game yeah. companies. They said on the podcast, like, there's so many video game companies that make so much money. Yep. Yeah. I think they say this is bigger than, um, the video game industry is bigger than music, m- movies, and books combined or whatever. And it has been since the 90s. Yeah, yeah that's the that was the interesting thing yeah. we uncovered on the Nintendo episode is that stat gets bantied around, bantered, bandied? Yeah, yeah. bandied around a lot right now, which is, it's very interesting because, like, the video game market has done this, but... Uh, the video game market has basically always been larger than TV and movies combined, but has never gotten attention or like been thought it's of as a legitimate It's one of those secrets that's been out there form. for 30 years that yeah. people haven't paid attention to. Yeah. All right. I'm afraid of these memory cards filling uh, up. Um, this has been wonderful. Yep. Thanks for having me, guys. Listeners, thank you. We almost never say this, but I think we got to do this again. Let's do it again. I'll be here next week. No. <laughs> 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 Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. All right. Bye. Well, listeners, thank you for going on the journey with us with David. We would love your feedback on the session's format as we sort of continue to refine it. It's obviously very different than our LVMH Nintendo-style episodes, and getting your thoughts on how we can continue to improve it would be uh, hugely helpful. Also, go check out the Founders podcast. Search Founders in any podcast player. Also, if you want to go deeper, you can become an acquired LP to come closer into the acquired kitchen. We have bi-monthly Zoom calls, and we just announced that we will be asking our LPs to help us pick future episodes, so you can join at acquired.fm slash LP. You should subscribe to our second show, ACQ2, formerly the LP show, for expert interviews with founders and investors. Just search ACQ2, all one word, in any podcast player. Also, join us in the Slack, discuss this episode and all the others. There's now over 15,000 smart, thoughtful, kind members at acquired.fm slash Slack. It's pretty cool. I think, David, that represents only like 5 to 10% yeah. of those of you out there who listen every month. It's funny. I literally texted Ben yesterday, and I was listening to the Nintendo episode that we just released, and I was like, the way we talk about the Acquired Slack, it kind of makes it sound like only 15,000 people listen to Acquired. <laughs> no, that is 5% of the people that listen to Acquired. Yeah, all the rest of you, come join us in the Slack, acquired.fm slash Slack. I don't know. It's just a great way for us to get a better pulse on all of you, who you are, and what you like or don't like or want us to improve about the show. So that's all we got, listeners. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. We'll see you next time. Who got the truth? Is it you, is it you, is it you who got the truth now, huh?